Coming next year is a documentary celebrating Street Fighter 2. Step back in time to the early 90s and relive the glory days when the fighting genre and the arcades changed forever. Check out the Kickstarter link below and help make this project become a reality. Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here. Today my good friend Tim Partridge is joining me for a commentary to Batman Returns. You may remember Tim from the fairly recent Who Framed Roger Rabbit commentary and our discussion on the first Batman film from 1989. How are you doing Tim? Hi Oliver, I'm great thank you, how are you? I'm doing well, I've got everything sorted now for Christmas, so that was last minute things I was doing the last couple of days, but it's, you know, I'm pretty happy now I've got everything sorted, but only one day of celebration here in the UK, which is a bit annoying, but hey ho, it can't be helped. <laughs> <laughs> so folks, if you would like to sync this commentary with your own copy of Batman Returns, put the timestamp to zero and press play now. Okay, and we begin on the Warner Brothers logo before going into our opening image. And um, this is an incredibly, well, uh, it's, it's an outstanding opening sequence because it's so visual. Nearly everything except for one word is visual. And you open, you've got this really ornate uh, building of the cobble pots with cherubs in front. And you've got a guy looking out um, from, from his abode at everywhere around him. And you see repeated across the film, there's images of people looking out and uh, you know of, of, of buildings uh, and he turns behind and of course it reveals that he's uh, he's he's waiting for something to happen in the other room and we see the nurse come out in 50s of time it's incredibly ornate this building it's really and it gives a sense of timelessness too because you don't know you don't really know what time it is apart from the you know the nurse's outfit doesn't really give a uh, you know a sense of time uh, that's true and then I love it when you dissolve here. This sequence here, this is so good. They're staring, again, they're looking out the window, they're looking at their loved one, uh, you know, who's, who's right in front of them. They turn around and you feel like time has passed. And um, it was very clever here too that you've got the, uh, the rubber ducky on top uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the cat for later. But if you look at the faces too of his parents here, and the way the music plays, and they look at each other and they down those drinks, it's like, right, that's, it's like they're saying, right, that's it. We've had enough. You've killed the you've killed the cat. You know, <laughs> you know, we've got to get put this out, um, and then it, this great vertical camera move down into the, into the abandoned zoo, um, and and these two parents of Oswald. I mean, here now they're going past. They've got their, um, their you know they're pushing their pram, and you can see a white one going past, and they they're putting up appearances. They're all like, hey, yes, you know everything, you know, Merry Christmas. The one bit of dialogue. And then they get to the bridge and they're looking left and right. And this is really what the film's kind of about. You know, as I was saying before, the windows, it's like, uh, whereas the first film, you know, it was about appearances and identity and, you know, duality is with that. With here, it's, 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 it's about, it's almost like pride and there's an element of family legacy too. I love the, this bit where you've got the, you know, the, the, the uh, two parents looking out and there's that drop. Can you see there's a drop at the top of the screen where, where, the, oh, yeah. um, where, where, where they're just waiting for it. It's like they're waiting for it to clear. They're not looking at their child and going, oh, beautiful child, you know, we, we've, we, 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 we're letting him go. Oh no, this is terrible. It's like they're just waiting for that thing, you know, for the basket to drop so it clears. Um, and um, yeah, what an amazing, uh, amazing opening. Well, you've got the, you know, the wonderful sort of Danny Elfman theme, which is, um, I always, I, I do love the music for Batman Returns. It's got, it's got more of the sort of Edward Scissorhands kind of uh, style to it with a sort of heavy choir throughout. Um, the, the theme itself isn't as quite aggressive as the first sort of recording he did for the 89 film, but it's just a bit, little bit more finessed, I think. And, uh, and it's, I was going to say the first film is like really about spectacle and scope, isn't it? It's like a big yeah, action yeah. movie, and this isn't that, you know. And this has obviously the CGI bats here, doesn't it? For very, the film's sprinkled with a little bit of CGI, but everything is pretty much just opticals and miniatures, incredible miniatures throughout this film. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and also too, you got the um, as you got the basket going through it, obviously kind of alludes to um, to a kind of almost ironic kind of Moses imagery, and we'll yeah we'll mention a bit more about that later um sure. but yeah this is an entirely visual opening and um i just think it's it's absolutely breathtaking i wasn't a fan of this film oliver growing up were you 
I was I was quite a big fan of it, but the more I watched it as I got older, I it sort of became more clear to me that it wasn't a Batman movie. It was a more of a Tim Burton movie, very much a Tim Burton movie, and it wasn't. It didn't feel like it was of the same world, so to speak, as the first film because everything was so radically different with its production design. Well, not radically is a strong word, but it's it felt Gotham felt it transformed into something else a little bit and. Um, and as a kid, you know, you know, I, I was just waiting to see Batman. But as you sort of, you can probably calculate the amount of time Batman is on screen. It's he's he's barely in it, which is frustrating, especially for a sequel where you expect him to be, you know, doing more Batman stuff. Um, and I, you know, I couldn't see this in the cinema. It came out in July of '92, and I was only nine years old. I was a couple of months away from turning ten, and looking in my local evening newspaper it was listed there as a 12 rating and i i begged my mum if she could probably take me she goes no oliver you're too young to see this and so i couldn't again see a batman film at the cinema so i had to wait pretty much a year or so now maybe about six months probably for it to come out on tape to rent but yeah and i was um but you know like every kid at the time it was just kind of wrapped up in all the the, the hype and marketing and there were so many was far more toys for this film than the first one which only had a small selection of figures and a bat cave and a batmobile and a bat wing but this one had like batman you know in various degrees of different outfits and uh, i remember tim when i went to visit you years ago you you had the bat cave didn't you for batman returns or was it batman forever my brother had it uh, it was it, it was for returns but it was molded for uh, batman um, i was just want to say here do you notice when the basket comes up you just get mm. an over the shoulder of five penguins and then it cuts to gotham city 33 years later and again yeah. visual storytelling you just know from that he's been raised by penguins yes. you know there's no exposition nobody goes back to that nobody says he's been raised by them um you know i think also like to um you talk about differences between the first film and this and this one the yeah. first film, I think, you know, it was, a, it was a great, spectacular, hugely, you know, huge scope to it, uh, action blockbuster. But it also, it, it felt there was a kind of, there's almost like a slight punk vibe to it. it and I mean that in terms of like, you've got Batman, who's basically an anti-establishment policeman. And you've got the Joker, who's this, this gangster who, um, you know, who, who becomes... Um, you know, who ends up doing crime his way. He gets transformed into this clown. And you see, like, you know, graffiti getting sprayed across an art gallery and that kind of stuff. And, and it's the idea of, like, all this colour going on this kind of, like, monochrome world. Um, and I'd say with this film, it goes... You know, it's, it's like an offshoot of that. It goes more... If we're going to say the first one, if we do, do play with that concept that it's, like, punk, this is more going goth rock. And I don't just say that because the music's by Susie and the Banshees. Um, as well but like if you look everyone's in base makeup there's a lot of vintage you know victorian clothing um uh, you know you've got the, the freak show stuff as well too and um yeah it's 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 just it's more of an offshoot of like edward scissorhands as well very much there's so. more of a kind of a expressionistic sort of architecture and design isn't there there's you know the first one you know anton first design was this kind of mix of japanese architecture with kind of gothic imagery with you know like the sort of mix of those sort of a few the forties of the future, you know, that sort of the world world's fair sort of thing where they thought of what the future would be to a certain degree. Kind of everything's built upon each other, kind of retrofitting. And this one is, um, I, I always felt this one has felt like a smaller movie as well because of the shooting, you know, in a studio uh, in Burbank, California, instead of like the back lot of Pinewood. Um, it felt like a more of a, you know, a sort of a despite it sort of expanding itself with matte paintings to see the world of Gotham it, it felt like such a smaller movie and Tim Burton or you know with his cameraman they shoot everything's pretty much covered in a lot of close-ups and medium shots there isn't this I suppose down to the size of the set they couldn't do that many wides yeah well also lighting as well this was shot on a 100 ASA film whereas the first film was shot on 500 ASA film and that just means the sensitivity of the film stock on this just needed a lot more light and it feels often a lot of the time especially with Catwoman and people wearing very dark clothing you need a lot of light to really you know to 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 to, to for anything to register uh, I was going to say you really play sexism well in this shot here with all these kind of you know all these these white guys sat around this this table looking at the one woman and sort of belittling her even the mayor who's meant to be a good you know he's meant to be a good guy he's kind of laughing at her when uh, Shrek says um 
uh, you know, I haven't housebroken Miss Miss Kyle. Um, and uh, Daniel Waters talks uh, quite a bit about um, his view on feminism too in a, a really good um, podcast that I found uh, on, online on the diaboliquemagazine.com. Check that out. Uh, it was a really good interview with him there. Um, you were saying before, actually, Oliver, just about production design. Um, yeah, in the first film, it was... Anton First has talked kind of about how um, he really wanted to kind of get across this idea of, of there being like corrupted zoning in, in a city like New York uh, and the idea that things have been built on top of each other all by different architects so it all kind of looks different but it all kind of looks the same and dreary and this idea of like hell erupting through the pavements and keeping on going and it's kind of relentless there's nothing really nice about Gotham City at all in the first one it's just it really is just hell there's it nothing creates, it's a very threatening town isn't yeah. it yeah so you see that you see that in the opening sequence where well, this one is kind of yeah. a little bit more despite this kind of you know we, we see these kind of darker aspects of this of Gotham City with the with the cobble pots but we see a far more a somewhat more jolly um you know entrance to Gotham um, or introduction to Gotham yeah, uh, yeah. with everyone celebrating Christmas which is kind of you know a positive vibe anyway but also too, like you know, just to go back about you were saying about the opening, like the first film opens with a family, a beautiful family, kind of getting threatened, and you know the worst thing happening: a child watching his parents, uh, kind of in despair. His dad knocked out by a thing, you know, they're mugged, and he's kind of left there. And it, and and the film very much sort of builds towards the you know the the whole conflict of of um, Batman and the Joker and and, and Bruce really wanting to go you know go after his go after the joker for revenge of killing his parents whereas in this film it's like doing the opposite thing where you've got a family that it looks beautiful on the outside but actually on the inside it's absolutely toxic and it's terrible and the whole film is about looking left and right much like edward scissorhands like that suburbia in edward scissorhands it's very much about looking left and right and judging people and you know oh he's the outsider who's the outsider well things are actually toxic inside you know um and it's saying a lot it's saying a lot about kind of the, the time it was made and I think you know a lot of those filmmakers grew up in the 50s as well um, so you know they were used to that kind of very conservative suburbia and we've mentioned before uh, you know in other conversations about things like David Lynch and white picket fence suburban Americana and you, you know you had that in Edward Scissorhands and I think going back to production design in this film you kind of get like th there's a lot more kind of like nostalgic American elements and I remember reading in magazines about how uh, Dr. Seuss was kind of an influence. It, it, yes, there's there's um, big kind of concrete fascism, uh, fascist arch architecture. Sorry, fascist arch architecture, which Bo Welch talks about. Um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, and, and having those big kind of like uh, sort of almost Russian statues, um, and, and the idea of power. You know, like really, really showing power across the, you know the place. But there's also like you get a lot more kind of like red bows and things, and like you say, Christmas and that big layer of snow going across it. Um, and it feels like a kind of lived-in kitsch Americana that maybe you know you just get from living there, but maybe you know they couldn't tap into as much filming in in in, in Britain on the first film. Um, yeah, possibly. Yeah, because they kept the set of Gotham. Uh, at Pinewood for like two years yeah. they left it there you know Warner Brothers paying it, paying for it to be, to be left there and then they had to sort of dismantle it I think there was some talks that Jack Nicholson took some of the set to keep for himself um, but yeah it was a, bit of a, it was a shame it didn't come back because I remember when we, I spoke to Peter Young you know when we did that Superman 4 documentary and I said look you know, it's a shame you didn't come back for number two and he was like yeah it was a kind of like once you know they were in LA they just chose a different team um, which was a you know, well, because Anton first had passed away, so they couldn't make use of him again. Yeah, yeah. Um, this this is so good, isn't it? This I, I, this is it's there's something about Burton's uh, movies, right? With well, with Batman specifically, there's something that's really like. At one side, it's really goofy and absurd and silly, <laughs> but on the other side, it's absolutely monumentally, breathtakingly jaw dropping. Well, this stuff here, the, the, the bit where the bat signal comes through Wayne Manor, I think is a wonderful sequence, uh, wonderfully lit. I mean, it's a shame they changed uh, the look of Wayne Manor. It keeps changing for each movie. But um, I think it kind of, with that sort of Citizen Kane kind of little, like style of filmmaking here, um, I think it kind of it play, it works in its favour with the changes. Definitely. And you've got Wayne looking out of a window. And then you've got, this is a point of view too, of Cobblepot looking out from the sewer grate as well. Um, too and, and I like the idea as well of Wayne being like you know because in this he's a really introverted recluse and I never got I never really got that as a kid 
because I was so used to the idea in the comics and, and, and in the TV show of him being a socialite. And when I finally saw Christian Bale doing it, you know, I thought, uh, you know, this is what it should be. And I really like that bit in Batman Begins where he, you know, his house gets burnt down and he pretends to be drunk, mm. you know, and he's putting on that kind of face. Whereas in this, he's just, he darts away. And I, you know, and he, and he, you know, we've said this before, he's not really in the movie that much. And the logic yeah. of it completely makes sense. You know, he doesn't want to be, he wants to be in the shadows and say as little as possible. Um, mm. Because, because, because I know because, because Keaton was given a lot more dialogue, but he thinned a lot of it down, didn't he? To sort of just do short sentences. He goes, oh, Batman wouldn't say that. You know, or my Batman wouldn't say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, and also, um, I read a couple of versions of the script um, as well. I read, um, I think, one of the early drafts by uh, Daniel Waters. And then I read, I th it must have been the rewrite, uh, um, the, uh, what Wesley Strict, Strict had done. And um, there was a lot more dialogue. There's a lot of stuff when yeah. you watch it. You just you can see that it's all kind of, you know, cut out. Um, and um, yeah, and, and actually this opening here too, um, in it, you know, in the script that I read, uh, it opens on you know this 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 um, building that he's about to drive these two clowns into that's yes. on fire. Um, it's like it's like a Batman memorabilia store. So it's kind of like satirizing the kind of the big kind of event success <laughs> of the first film. Um, yeah. And I, I read somewhere that at the last minute they got that cut out. But it's in those two drafts that I read. And, and one one was from like September 1991. Um, so it's quite close to filming because also because Tim Burton was a bit frustrated with the sort of merchandising stuff and it was obviously you know even this kind of second one they were wanting to know all the designs for things he goes well i don't know what it's going to look like you know so um that was a difficult thing of sort of making a movie that you really want to make and getting hassled by you know m companies on outside of warner brothers wanting to make toys you know yeah yeah you know the other big um influence i think on this too with with daniel waters being being the writer is um the influence of heathers as well and this kind of this film is basically that Heathers and Edward Scissorhands mashed together isn't it that's true that's true yeah. and Heathers too is kind of like about your you know your outcast um you know the the, the, the unpopular people um you know the people who are kind of living in, in in the shadows away from kind of the mainstream as it were you know well, it was an interesting thing because when you sent me that interview with Daniel Waters he said you know he didn't like the first Batman film he loved the look of it but he wasn't happy with the story and Tim Burton you know he said wasn't happy with the first film um, and he, you know Tim was only sort of drawn back to do this because he could you know have more creative freedom um, and I think that's sort of you know in some cases we, we you know it could be seen as a positive but I think it was a sequel that people weren't expecting. I think they were kind of expecting it to do to sort of follow the sort of the traditional path of a sequel. Um, and this one, as Tim Burton said, he said it wasn't a sequel. This feels like just just another chapter in sort of Batman's kind of story. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's almost a bit like Gremlins too, in a way, isn't it? When you get the same director back and they just don't want to do anything that's like the first one, you know? And they yeah, kind of go yeah. And think, they don't want to. They don't want to repeat themselves, do they? And and he doesn't repeat himself with this. And um, but I I think as a young as a young, but also the reaction this film got was that they said it was too dark, that it was too grim, and upset a lot of the sort of the you know the the merchandise you know uh, companies um, who were sort of wanting to sort of promote this movie, and and the feedback was quite negative. And it obviously didn't perform as well as the first one, which is kind of a diminishing returns anyway of sequels. Nowadays, sequels often, you know, do double what the original one did. But back in the early 90s, it was a different scenario. Um, and the reviews as well. Roger Ebert wasn't happy with it. And Gene Siskel, Barry Norman said it, that she had, he felt it had no, little to no story. Um, which I think, I think is a bit harsh. But I, I always felt this film sort of falters in its third act. I think it um, doesn't quite have the... Uh, the sort of dramatic thrust the, of the yeah of the first one which had the you know the you know the streets of gotham attacked by joker in the back wing and then you suddenly got the church sequence you know that was a great sort of finish but this just has the bat belt you know and batman not doing much else um, i kind of yeah i i mean i i just this sequence here as well like um for me i think structurally there are issues with the film i mean it goes without saying mm. like when they set out to make the film they were like you have to have the catwoman you have to have Penguin. That was like studio mandate. And then they they had to uh, cut their cloth, you know, according to that brief. 
and um, and it does feel kind of overstuffed. And then you have got Christopher Walken's character as well, which is mm. too much, yeah. I think. But I, for me personally, I think for what they're trying to say as well, like I, I, I think we kind of know too much early on. Like it's all given away here, isn't it? And I think like y you know that the Triangle Circus gang, you know that Penguin uh, are working together immediately. You've just seen people having being chased by flamethrowers and you know clowns with Uzis firing at pedestrians. Like <laughs> these these people don't you know they 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 you know they're kind of um, uh, beyond remorse or anything you know. So it's like. Uh, where do you kind of go with that? We're just kind of waiting for them to to end, you know. There's no more surprises, is there? You know, because you you're essentially waiting for the sort of people of Gotham to play catch up to yeah, you know what Shrek's going to do and and try and manipulate the the public to get his way with by using the penguin. Um, but the penguin, I think, I suppose the only thing that is kind of would be a surprise would be Penguin's true motives, which isn't. You know, it's a quite a dark motive way like killing all the firstborns, um, but it's which they you know, you know they they abandon that and then it just mm. becomes about uh, you know about going and detonating Gotham and there's also a kind of <laughs> yeah. I feel like you know I was saying before there's Penguin, Catwoman, Shrek, then you've got the Red Triangle Circus Gang, then you've got the Penguins, and they're like two separate entities almost, and you've got this yeah. this I mean they showed that opening shot that establishing shot here of this zoo. That kind of, you know, it's a beautiful shot that I thought was CGI when I was a kid because it's just so in focus and pristine. It's a motion control shot, but it's kind of like, why are we seeing this world? Why do we need to know about this zoo? And he's often talks about, you know, having been brought up in the sewers, but this isn't the sewers. This is the. You know, it's like they. It's almost like talked like they're two. You know, these two separate places are the same, and that kind of logic. You know, it's, it's quite cluttered. Um, and and then they go on here too. They you know he talks about his old uh, Shrek's old partner Fred, and they pull out his hand. Um, yeah. So you know that that Shrek is a terrible person, and we kind of it's planted earlier anyway when he's discussing with with the mayor. But anyway, I think in spite of those problems, it's still it's so thematically interesting and it's so rich. And the, you know the thing that I think makes this different from the first one. Is that in the first one? It's like it's it's incredibly uh, straightforward and quite conservative with its morality. You know, it's it's even though it is uh, he's the Batman, he's dark. Oh, but he's the good guy. Oh, look, there's the smiley, happy clown who's of the people. Oh, he's the bad guy. Ooh, 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 and it's that kind of duality <laughs> thing. Uh, really, when you grind it down, it's good versus evil. he's a bad guy. He's a good guy. It's clean cut. This film, uh, watching it recently, what blew me away is the morality is so blurred. Like pe mm. some people are good, some people are bad, some people at the same time, you know, like real people. Um, and it's a world, the world is so stylized and it's so monochrome. Uh, you know, it's like rich blacks and rich whites, uh, you know, in, in, in the cinematography and the production design and, you know, it, uh, uh, like really high contrast look to it um, superficially. But underneath, it's actually really grey, you know, like. Well, yeah, because the film could work extremely well in black and white you know um and i think i mean once you you know you, once you see the movie in a sort of high definition or you know on or, or on film it's seeing this the contrast of snow and the black sort of outfits or the setting it just looks incredible i think this is a this is this the simple colors black and white just works so well for the movie yeah um and that's what we saw in edward scissorhands you know when you out of that suburban area and you go into where edward since the hand lives, always been residing for so long, you you get that similar look, and uh, and it works wonders. Yeah, well, it's draining when you drain the color, and then you just what he does is he puts in. I mean, this is one thing that Burton really pioneered that everyone copied. Um, mm. But it's it's like the idea that you just minimise the colours. You have like two basically two colours on screen at the same time. I mean, here it's basically well green and red, which we talked about in you know in the, in the last film. Um, but there are other scenes too where it's it's yeah it's just it's it's black, it's white, and and but but as I say, like in terms of like the content of the film, like the morality of it, you know who is good, who is bad. There's scenes where you see Batman committing what looks almost like murder you know um and and you you see that kind of everyone's kind of got a good side and a bad side there's scenes that become kind of unreserved there's a lot there's a lot that's said in terms of duality um i love this set i love this um 
scene with um, with 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 Michelle Pfeiffer as uh, Selena Kyle, uh, and the the actual set itself too. So like there's this beam. You notice there's a beam that goes through the middle, um, that's meant to be there to sort of symbolise, uh, you know, the oppression that's 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 on her um, as as a person and as working for Max Shrek. Um, and, and being an outcast too, because that's what she really is. And it looks, you know, this set is so good because it just feels like, it feels like everything in it has come from a thrift store. You know, it looks... Well, yeah. And also you have, you, you, you get a sense that Selena is this woman who's come from this maybe sort of small, quaint town has moved to the big city to sort of, you know, to get a successful career and has just like been lumped with this sort of secretary job or PA to Shrek and, um, and is everything around her is kind of just it's, no, nothing's working out for her um and she's sort of slipping and sliding at her job and you know what we'll see comes as sort of a and as you say sort of she's sort of repressed as well and once she becomes Catwoman she becomes everything that she kind of wants to be but there's a there's a side effect of that that she is just like evil as well or didn't know or didn't know what she you know she didn't know what she was it's almost like a, she has she literally has an identity crisis at the end of the film as well doesn't she yeah um, yeah yeah but yeah this this apartment it just looks like it's like the the room that nobody wanted uh that's not really designed for anyone <laughs> to be in and i mean even look at awful like uh armchair she's sat in and the i mean it's really like hyper kitsch stuff you know really yes um, yeah well that falls in line with the 60s thing doesn't it with burton's love for those sort of periods you know same with Edward Scissorhands. It looks, I mean, Edward Scissorhands, you know, Edward Scissorhands, I always thought was set in the 50s as a kid. And now you watch it and you realise that it's like they've taken kind of all the kind of kind of memorably tacky kitsch stuff uh, mm. fr from different I I decades, starting from the 50s onwards and kind of mashed them in and created this 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 world, uh, this kind of very colour coordinated world. Um, which is uh, it's it, it became its own universe, but yeah, it's kind of a similar thing. It's it's it, I mean it's it's kind of like I guess now how you hear about a lot of filmmakers doing stuff set in the eighties with neon lights and all this kind of stuff. It's the stuff you grow up on, you know. Um, and it's just... well, yeah, it, it's it's kind of taking like visual elements from different decades, but also setting it in a sort of contemporary time. But because this film, it feels like it, it could be in the past or it could be now. And that's the same with, you know, the, the first Batman film. But I think this one's kind of a little bit more evident that it's kind of pulling from very much a sort of the kitsch kind of 60s and 50s kind of appeal of Tim Burton's youth. Yeah, definitely. And also, I think in the first one, there was, a, I mean, as well, like the mayor they have in the first one is is an Ed Koch lookalike. He was the mayor in you know in, in New York, you know in the eighties, um, mm. and and it fits in with kind of a, a bit of an urban decay narrative too. In that, but Gotham actually looks really gritty in the first one. It looks worn down. It looks lived in. And as you said before, it's shot outside on a set, and it looks weathered. Whereas this doesn't. This looks like it. This kind of looks like what I imagine. You know, again, like Tim Burton sat in Burbank, um, in the. 50s well in the 60s sat watching tv watching black and white films on tv where things have all been created on a hollywood set um uh, you know watching uh was well, you know citizen kane or watching you know, old universal horror films watching cat people as well valentine's cat people um which is is mentioned in that uh a podcast that i mentioned before as well those kind of films um and and, and you know very stylized very of their time and then kind of making it now you know, making a world like that now, a kind of, it's a somewhere else kind of world, isn't it? It also feels a little bit more artificial, though, you know, when you... That's what the I mean. grittiness of... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, it doesn't... I mean, that's why I like, that's what I love about the first one. Yeah. That it felt like a, a lived-in world and it was shot outside. It wasn't confined to a studio back lot or just sort of in, inside a, you know, a soundstage. Um, and uh, uh, Tim Burton sort of, you know, had a, lot, had a lot more difficulties with this film because of that, where he shot it. Um, and also just down to the space, trying to get enough speed up for the Batmobile to do, you know, to do, yeah, yeah. You know, to sort of get enough, you know, speed on the camera. Um, could you just run out of set? Um, and also, and also, also, because he tried to escape from uh, John Peters in, you know, in the first one. Now he's gone and, you know, filmed in uh, filmed in L.A. where Peters, John Peters, is literally around the corner. <laughs> This scene is really, really. Uh, this is a great scene too, and there's no. This made me jump as a kid, you know. Just like you know, great build up. There's hardly any music as well. I noticed before as well. You you had Geraldo the Chihuahua that he talks about. It was framed kind of mm. behind Max, and it's almost like it's predatory. It's like um, that scene in Psycho where Norman Bates is talking. You can see the hawk behind him. Um, yeah. This is no. When she falls here, look. There's no music. 
And it's the same like oh, in Batman wonderful. as well. Like when you hear machine guns and you hear um, the, the factory blows up in the first film and that kind of stuff. They cut out the music, they cut out the sound. There's an interesting credit online, isn't it, for Zoran Perisic, where he the Zoptics was what involved oh, with yeah. this. And, and was he was it for this sequence here when she fell and um, no, no, some no. of the bit where from what I gather, this stuff when she just fell out the the, the, the uh, building, I think that might be blue screen actually. Right. Um, is, is this when the Ice Princess falls? It looks a bit like Superman the movie when you know he's flying up. The no, building. they 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 use those optics. I'll tell you about those optics stuff later. But they basically use sure. that for. Um, basically because of the reflective costumes later on. But I'll, we'll get to that. Oh, right. um, this is often discussed sequence as well, too. Um, well, it's, it's not, it's, 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 this is not true at all to the origins of Catwoman. It's completely this, like, more twisted version. She's, you know, Catwoman's a cat burglar. You know, as a kid, I'd, I had read Batman Year One, and Catwoman was very much not the, you know, the Catwoman of the movies. Um, so this was... But I, I just kind of accepted it for what it was until I got a bit older and sort of got more into the sort of the other characters on the Batman universe and I was like well, this is just still bollocks you know uh, but you know people love it for for just how sort of dark and twisted it is um well, the cats all bitter just gave her nine lives you know yeah uh, I I really like this sequence coming up too again another all visual one um mm. you know she comes back to her place and she's almost zombified um, yeah she is I, I I love too that the way that the film takes a lot of things that seem almost supernatural like borderline they're sitting on the side but they're not it's like it's like that thing they say about almost a bit like the thing they say about james bond where it's not it's not the impossible but it's the improbable like you know i've heard about people falling out of building building you see in the news people falling out of buildings falling 10 stories down and surviving um who's to say a bunch of cats happened to be around the corner and started chewing their fingers randomly. Um, and it makes a great poetic image. It's something you can read into, you know, pharaohs and everything else. But, um, oh, I love this. This, 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 this works on, again, this works on great levels. Notice the framing here. You've got, again, that big beam behind it, that oppression that's just pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, it's really cleverly done. But I like that this is, firstly, she hates Shrek. That's kind of like, we, we know that. We know... Uh, as the as, as the answering machine's talking, it's her boss. It represents her boss. But the subtext too is ladies' perfume makes you look beautiful. It makes you look glamorous. Makes you look like the you know. It makes you look like the the, the good-looking people, the mainstream, um, and and the materialism that comes with that too. Department store as well. And she doesn't have that. You know, she's living this thrifty place, heavily oppressed, not much money, trying to get by. And she and she's like we saw earlier before when um, she was in that boardroom too she's kind of the laughing stock she has to impress her boss you yes. know and this room yeah. full of men you know and here she's tearing it all up and i i love it i love this music so much it's, it's also like you know she's wearing glasses when she's you know the sort of you know the repressed sort of uh selena kyle when yeah. she's kind of been the nerd she's changes her glasses are off and she's sort of yeah exactly she sort of breaks out of that sort of um, shell I, I, i'm going to really read into things here i mentioned about goth before but one of the yeah. things, if you know, you read about, um, what they talk about with um, the idea of goth is that people, you know, it's anti-fashion, and um, uh, oh no, it's up there. Look, so many details <laughs> up there. There's a penguin, and there's the, the penguin thing. Oh, and this, 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 you know, when she gets this, uh, this, this coat, it's like, um, it's it's like the one that Catherine Deneuve wears in uh, in 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 Belle de Jour. Uh, anyway, sorry, I was going back to the the, the whole goth thing. You know, a lot of goths will raid, you know, it's sort of said that uh, one of the things is, uh, you know, in goth culture is, uh, and obviously not for everyone, this is a generalisation, but um, the idea of like raiding thrift shops, going in and finding yes. stuff and, t you know, cannibalising things and, so, you know, putting stuff together. And that's basically kind of what this is. Um, oh, and yeah. That's my over reading of it. OK, so <laughs> um, but uh, I, I love it. I think it's 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 so good. And um, oh, this music, the tone, everything. And in a second, she's going to turn and she's again, another person walking towards a window and looking at that window. And the questions yeah. that comes with it, you know, too, about perception and about how people see you, um, how you see yourself. Uh, mm. Do you care when you're standing next to a window? Are you looking out because you want people to look at you? Or you, you want to judge everyone else who's out there? You know, there's so many kind of like, I mean, this plays into um, kind of modern anxiety and uh, mindfulness and those kind of things. But it's just, it's so rich, you know. All that criticism we gave about structure and story before, you know, this, this is like, 
it's like a poem, isn't it? It's so many, so many it's, ideas. It's got this, it's, 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 it's clashes of sort of depression and darkness, which is kind of playful, kind of uh, circus kind of music to a certain degree. And they've got this, the, the, the bit you mentioned about the window, we see Catwoman from a distance. You don't see her up close yet. So it's kind yeah, of... Yeah, isn't that bizarre? That's, yeah, yeah. So you're not giving it's not seeing her in full at the moment. Gives you a taster, a... so you kept going for later. Yeah. Um, no, it's such a great shot there. It's so beautiful. Um, you were talking before about the um, the kind of artifice of this world. Um, mm. You know, and we were saying how it kind of looks, as I say, like the stuff that in the 1940s would have looked kind of, uh, you know, the kind of delib the artificial kind of world building, building on the soundstage. I mean, look here, look at the background. What is that drape in the background? Can you see behind the mayor? What is that? Like, is that meant to be part of the building or is that actually supposed to be the city? You know? Yeah, um, yeah. I think it, 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 it looks too much like a drape for them to not to say, hey, this is going to be an extension of the world. It's actually, I think it's just done for design, I think. Um, but you see... Well, I hope so. <laughs> you know, but the, you, it looks too obvious. You kind of see, but I think they're going for that, you know? I think they're really going for that. Um, I'm not actually quite sure, like, because when they talk about like the uh, the way that they um, stuck like re they basically turned the sound stages into giant refrigerators um, for this film to to create that winter sense. And from what I remember, because I used to have the making of book, they 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 basically even though it was shot in America, all the penguins came from the Cotswolds. I think or it was a company from the Cotswolds. I'm not joking. Yes, it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and anyway, so they needed to have the sound stages chilled. That wasn't an option. They had to have that for for the animals yeah. to work there. It's just bonkers, really, because if you if you put people in an environment where it's like chilled, cold, and then they walk out the sound stage into the blistering heat of LA, it would make you so ill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. See, I think I think this bit here where he rises, penguin rises out. I mm. think this should have been Max. You know, we should have seen. I mean, this is just I'm spitballing here, but like, <laughs> what if um, you know, for example, uh, Max had disappeared. We don't see him, or he meets Penguin, but but we're led to believe that Penguin and Triangle Circus Gang are two separate entities, and then Max yes. raises out from here, and then we we keep it a secret until, you know, the um, the the Batmobile sequence that it's actually mm. Penguin who who's who's a bad guy. You know, like, uh, I think uh, that way you'd be kind of, I mean, it's not the, <laughs> I don't know, I just, I've had many millions of different ideas. Well, it's, it's, it's the idea, you know, I think before recording this, we had a discussion about sort of how we would have changed things story-wise. I think, as you know, what's criticised about the movie was that, it, that, that, is that there, are, is that there are, are too many characters in the movie. Um, I think they should have probably removed max shrek and just had like the cobblepot family had built up this company that essentially is max shrek's company and they die and whoever's going to be left who's going to who's going to be left to run the company and they find out they had a son and he comes to take over and then that's how it sort of plays out um so i i that's the Having two villains is kind of fine, but when you've got essentially three mm. with Batman, it, it's just so much screen time has to be sort of dedicated to give enough time for them, for the audience to get invested in. Um, and that's that's where that's where the problems lie with the movie for me. Yeah. Um, and and I, it's you know, there's an argument for Batman to be in the shadows and and to be a supporting character in his own movie. But for me, I just wanted more Batman. You know, I wanted, I like this parts of the movie where we got this moment here where he's sort of sympathizing with. Yeah, Penguin. it's great. Um, and, 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 but he's, he's still unsure. That's why we see him begin to sort of spy on the, the penguin. He's driving around the streets at night and he, he's suspicious. And I like that aspect where he begins to research. He's doing Batman stuff because he is, the, you know, yeah. apparently he's supposed to be the greatest detective. Yeah. Um, so he does do some detecting, but I was wanted kind of more from him. Yeah, yeah. Well, to backtrack just to that bit where he's looking, sorry, he skipped over it just there, uh, the, uh, of Bruce looking at the TV and saying, I hope he finds his parents. I like that you don't really know what that means, you know, like the subtext to that. Mm. Like, is is Bruce kind of falling into his own feelings about himself at that point? Um, you know, is he looking at... Because he's looking at it sort of superficially on the top. And as you say now, he's starting to do the research. It, they kind of, they're planting here now that you're seeing, you know, Penguin turning around, he's writing the list. You know, he's not there to find out who his, his, his parents are. Um, but, uh, yeah, like it's... Uh, it's yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot going on. Um, uh, how do you feel about how do you feel about the changes to the Batcave for this one? Because there's a little bit more. It's 
I suppose it, it's a, it seems smaller, um, but it, I mean, he has a lot more equipment around him. Because in the first film, it was just like this, you know, this 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 uh, chair with all these multiple monitors and a computer. Yeah. And his, and his suit was just one suit he had. It was what we saw in this kind of contained unit where he kind of, you know, opened up. But in this one, he's got like, <laughs> he's got all these like, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a little bit, a little bit comedic ways. He just uh, got a row of like eight Batman suits. And he goes, mm, I love this one, you know. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, no, it's fun. I, oh, just quickly, again, just another really clever bit. I love that bit. I think you pronounce it Vichy Soise. The, uh, the the meal it's that he's cold. having, he's the like, cold yeah. one. But again, like he's looking at, uh, he's researching about uh, about cobble pot, um, yeah. and he's detecting. He's doing Batman. Yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. But he's kind of like sort of forming an opinion, trying to find out where he kind of is and what is is cobble pot really this rich guy or is he re- you know this this uh, kind of guy who 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 um, is innocent or is there something bad going on? And it's and I like that when he's he's got that meal and he's you know he takes it and it's it, it's cold it kind of just shows that he's he's a regular guy you know like uh even yes. though he's this guy who, who's to the man of born and everything else and 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 he's and obviously there are parallels there between him and cobblepot as well bruce and cobblepot too and that they both came from wealth and that's brought up later on and i like that idea that cobblepot is removed from that by how he looks in the circumstance so he missed out on having that that life um but then you know the, the idea of entitlement and um questioning it too you know like well bruce is is being given food that he doesn't even know about or appreciate so is he really is <laughs> cultivated as uh, you know uh, again those kind of like perceptions of rich people and i i, I think it's yeah that's very clever i think i think bruce wayne is um more of an interesting character in this movie yeah. than the previous one um this one, he's you know, he seems a little bit more um, normal, I, I think, with interacting with people, and we get to see him being Bruce Wayne, you know, as a businessman as well, mm. um, as he, with his conversations with Shrek, and he's very much just like black and white, you know, he's very much like, well, this is wrong, I don't believe in this, you know, um, and disagreeing with Shrek's business practices. And you can kind um, of see him holding himself in a room as well with someone else and not become weird. Yes. And I like the bit where they talk about, he references the mayor as well, um, that he sees eye to eye with him and things. So he's not just a complete, he's not completely isolated like he is in the original. Do you notice there that when the penguin just walked past the uh, gravestone, his uh, his long fur coat makes the makes the polystyrene <laughs> flex uh, forward um, but this this is again this is uh, I think this whole sequence and the bit after this where he's talking to the press penguin um, I think it's really great because he you know as I say he's a he's a, uh, a monster kind of beyond redemption unfortunately um, and sort of you know the evil Edward Scissorhands um, but they make a lot of effort uh, with select sequences to really give pathos and humanity to him really show that he's a tragic character um mm. and you know i think devito he got i think didn't he get a razzie nomination for this did he that's that's not good is it i mean it, everyone i think it's kind of quite an iconic performance i think it's quite nuanced um, as well hey you notice as well at the gates i was saying before at the goth thing you got, I don't know, punks mm. or God. Sorry, I'm terrible here. Um, <laughs> painted, people are like, what are you talking about, Tim? No, um, but like, no, it's, it, but it's interesting that, that Tim Burton has chose to compose a frame and specifically um, put people dressed in certain clothes. Uh, in, you know, as you said, in a very kind of um, control. By the way, is that is that reporter? Do you think that's like this? Ver- Do you think that was supposed to be Knox from the first film? I... I I've never read anything to sort of indicate that it sh- that it could have been, but you know it would have been good to see him come back, even though he's not a popular character. But it just shows some sort of continuity, because um, there's you know they all see because this one they they do go back to sort of referencing the first one with you know the frustrations the fans had with Alfred letting Vicky into the Batcave, and they use that as a sort of you know, I think it's maybe Sam Ham's kind of or you know maybe Tim sort of throwing in that line like. You know, as a sort of, why did you do that? You know, to sort of sympathise with the fans, um, and, and there's references also to Vicky Vale later on when Selena Kyle's with Bruce 
um, for that dinner or you know to sort of get together at his at his mansion yeah that- so but that, there isn't much aside from just a couple of returning characters like commissioner gordon it it it, it doesn't really rely on what happened in the previous film to sort of set this one up at all don't you think this scene is great oh yeah it's brutal you know as well because it's like you know so it's a, you know it's a, it's a kid's film but there's something you know slightly rapey happening but it, happening but it turns here. it on its head the expectation oh, yeah. is and i love the way that it again it's sort of satirizing it where she's kind of going uh, after i mean the, actually sorry when, when i was a kid and i saw this and the blood appeared uh, it sort of blew my mind you know um but here this bit where she's kind of like she's got her eyelids half closed kind of like, oh i'm oh thanks and then she like pushes against mm. the wall and it's sort of again the morality is so blurred she's set up as a hero doing good and now she's <laughs> it's just brilliant yeah. it's so great and I, I love i love how she sort of exits by doing like these backflips like this obviously this gymnast did, did it extremely quickly but the um I love that, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer's getting into the swing of things yeah. and doing, you know, she's doing the kicks and punches there, which is great. Yeah, yeah. This is the, because the film centralises just around this set piece. So mm. to me, even as a kid, it, I just felt, oh, I just felt like such a cardboard kind of small world, you know. Um, despite, I think some people would criticise the first one for feeling a lot smaller than when, when they were making comparisons to Superman in terms of its scale, you know, but it's, um, Gotham is always, Batman's always centralised around Gotham. He doesn't go around the world. He doesn't go other places. So yeah, yeah, I yeah. think it's always going to have that, you know, as part of its kind of, its uh, makeup. Um, I was going to say too, Oliver, I think, well, a few things here. Firstly, outside the window, that mm. backing, I, like this, all, all inside looks beautiful this set looks gorgeous it's absolutely jaw-dropping look outside can you see there's like a water tower and what yeah. looks like a radio ma- what it kind of looks like something from a school play do you know what i mean these kind of uh, it doesn't fit in with the rest of, I, I think they're trying to go for like a forced perspective kind of very stylized uh you know german expressionist but also kind of classic hollywood kind of look to the to the background uh, to make it look really stylized but to me it doesn't quite work because everything else looks so real yeah it's kind of it looks more like you're seeing the 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 outside of new york you know sort of you've got the water towers things that's what you kind of but it looks like a scale model it looks like it's about Mm. five you know two feet away from christopher walken i was going to say about (laughs) um christopher walken and i i I only say that because it just to me this film is meticulously done and everything is so beautifully controlled um i think the other thing about walken sorry i forgot to mention this before i think with max shrek like he's talked about by Selina as being sanctimonious and he's meant to be holier than thou and the whole thing is that he's put on this front of being this guy who um, you know is all about the good and and uh, you know he makes that speech at the beginning um, you know to the crowd saying that he wants to give something back and he's very much a a voice of of what's right Um, and I just feel Christopher Walken in a Beethoven wig is a bit too interesting for this Um, he I think Christopher Walken, a more toned down, you know, look and approach, I think might have got that across better. I actually think maybe too, like maybe alternative casting, somebody like James Woods from the time or Kirk Douglas, somebody like that, some really Ooh, authoritative, yeah, yeah. someone who just created a massive contrast. And that's, again, Christopher Walken plays this to the direction and to everything. He's perfect and he's great. And I think a different Christopher Walken, uh, you know, subtler Christopher from his more subtle performances too, I think. Um, not sorry, and I mean that in terms of like his dress and everything else too. I I just would you think so because then you've got you know he's essentially the third villain where he needs to be, you know, a bit more flamboyant or a little bit more kind of colourful with his design that he has to, to fit in with that possibly sort of lineup. I think he should know. have been more like the mayor for me. This is again this is just this is a, this is more a, this is nothing about Christopher Walken. This is all about just. I guess storytelling and directing, but like I, for me, and who am I? You know, how many Batman films have I made? Um, but but you know, <laughs> I, I I just feel like when I hear Daniel Waters talking about this, and he's saying like the whole point is that you've got these characters who are sort of like, an, they're being looked down upon as animals: Catwoman, Batman, Penguin, and then there's actually this guy who's a guy in a suit, um, and he's a bit shady. You were saying earlier on um, that when you first saw this film, you didn't like it. Did you sort of? Was there, what was the sort of obvious reasons at the time as a as a kid, really? Um, it just didn't have the scale and scope of the original. It wasn't, I guess, looking like knowing a bit more now, I think. Again, the morality 
the uh, the dramatic thrust of it too it's very clear you know the original was very clear cut and you know in the first one you're kind of watching uh the joker who then is back you know he's, he's stabbed in the back and then he becomes sorry jack nicholson gets stabbed in the jack napier gets stabbed in the back and he becomes the joker <laughs> and then later on there's that revelation that actually oh he actually killed someone's parents and that dramatic thrust mm. that kind of like that revenge thing it, it's just it's you want to see him get to the top of the cathedral you want to see batman take this guy on you know uh whereas with this film i just remember when it got to the zoo at the end uh and thinking oh there's 20 minutes to go or whatever and i i, I just sort of i felt bored as a kid mm -hmm. and it was that thing of they've got to kill two villains now as well and it's sort of a bit, bit of a feeling of waiting for a bus to, to you know and that's when i wasn't alive to all of the rich kind of stuff i mean now i can watch it all the way through i think it's you know, I think it's so rich. I really do. It falls into, um, because we, we now know, or maybe Tim Burton said probably during the course of his career, that he was never interested in action films or action sequences when when making his own movies. Um, obviously, in the first one, he was very much sort of pushed by, you know, uh, the other producers, in particular John Peters, to do more action. And that's that's what that's, you know with come this one you know with tim very much in full control the action sequences aren't as very you know aren't that varied and there's there's and they're only kind of sprinkled throughout so as a kid or you know you know young lad wanting to you know get into this kind of new sequel to batman we were given less but with you know with the action and kind of relying more on you know, deeper characters and the conflicts they have and their personalities. And that's what interests Tim Burton, isn't it? It's always kind of the duality yeah. of things. Um, which is, you know, there's always a, there's two sides of the coin, isn't there? Some people just want more action. Some people just want more of what, you know, what what, what Tim wanted to bring to the Batman franchise. But because of their, because we've seen with the origin story of the Penguin and Catwoman being so different to the comics, it sort of begins to deviate far more from its sort its source material and becomes its own thing, and and that's, I suppose it is an adaptation. It's not a, it's not a true kind of you know copy of Batman. Um, I suppose if you look at it that way, I think nowadays I think it's far they're far more strict on being true to the origin stories of these characters and and the comics because. If you just see the numbers and see the you know the reviews of it, for each film that stay true to their source material, they often um, perform better. Yeah, yeah. Um, with the whole sequence where he comes down the staircase, which we just gone past there too, you notice that Shrek's wearing a basically a completely black and white outfit. And that area upstairs is totally colour drained. And when you come downstairs and they've just got all the colours, you know, uh, as he's standing at the base of the steps, it really it gives so much bang, you know. So I love the poster in the background because that is the comic book kind of Joker image, uh, Joker, sorry, Penguin image. And I remember as a kid, there wasn't an action figure of Danny DeVito. It was just this kind of recycled, you know, um, Penguin figure of the Superpowers line or something like that. Um, I was a bit disappointed with that. Yeah, Jan Hooks is really good in this too, as well. I like that Burton has these uh, comedy specialist actors uh, doing these yeah. kind of roles. It kind of reminds me of like Kit Hollaback as the news reporter in the uh, the first one, who gets the grin across her face. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but this is, you know, the other thing too. When you get older, you start to uh, listen more to dialogue, and I think maybe maybe maturity too. You're looking for subtext, and you're listening to stuff. I think we, also with Burton, he he um, he's a very visual director and i often i often found as well a lot of this i found quite like dialogue is almost inaudible at times you, you you because you have people kind of just whispering things christopher walken's doing his christopher walken dialect as well which is which is it, it, it's hard if you don't quite you know you're not used to that uh you know of course we love it now it's great um and and, and, and batman kind of whispers yeah, yeah speaks yeah. very quietly in, in in some scenes um obviously it's sounding a little bit in this one a little bit more like Clint Eastwood, you know. Um, they talk. They talk about like um, here now. I mean, Shrek sort of says that uh, you know he's, he's talking about he can run, how uh, Comcock could run for mayor at this point. And he's he's sort of mentioned yeah. he makes a reference to Nixon's impeachment, uh, and and the Reichstag fire and the Gulf of Tonkin. You know, these are real world 
kind of things but like when you're watching the film it feels like as you we kind of said it's sort of its own weird soundstage self-contained stylized expressionist world retro kind of elsewhere kind of thing um, and I like that it has that you know it has all of that, that all that dialogue when you do listen to it it's rich and it alludes to other stuff um, I mean at the end of this he mentions about um, unlimited Putang as well which I'll let, let you google um so uh you know it, but that that stuff doesn't you know that when i was a kid i didn't pick up on any of that stuff i mentioned all that stuff by the way because it's kind of it's stuff that only adults are really going to appreciate um generally i think because we're i think as kids we're used to hearing like very enunciated dialogue and stuff and you know as you get uh, older and you get more I guess probably more sensitive to and to listening to things um, yeah I I, I I love just the richness of that you've got all this great rich visuals and you've got interesting dialogue as well well there's the street level stuff here this kind of seems more in key with the Anton first stuff in some some of the sort of wides and stuff you can kind of see there's some similarities with the street level uh, moments at night um, but it's you know it's now 54 minutes into the movie and we, we saw Batman do some action briefly near the beginning and it's now nearly like you know nearly an hour in and he, we finally get to see Batman do his thing and it's a great sequence I love it it's bashed the head together I love the bit where he pulls the the, uh, the bat thing out and he throws it it looks like a like a, a, a Batman sort of game gear yeah. you know, which he throws um, this is obviously a stunt double um, I think the same guy who did the stunt work in the first one right. he's um but of course, he. I think I think Keaton did did say he wanted to do more in the bat suit in the fight scenes. But I think the only sort of when it cuts into a close up, it's Keaton. Sure, sure. This is the Warner Brothers backlot as well. This is backlot. This stuff. This is all backlot. Yeah. One of the things they do in this film that's quite interesting too, like in the first one we've mentioned before. Oh, here's your bit. I'll mention that in a sec. They had this great sequence here. With they cut that bit out, didn't they? In the UK, with, with the, the guy dog. spinning the nunchucks. Really? Yeah. Yeah, the UK one was cut because it's nunchucks. You know, BBFC hated that. But this is it's so wondrous, and it's like yeah, it's it's, and it's breathtaking and it's jaw dropping, but it's also incredibly goofy and and and, <laughs> and absurd, know, yeah. just mad and absurd. And I love the poodle, the poodle lady as well. She's called Poodle Lady, I think, in the uh, in the, in the <laughs> credits. Um, yeah, I think she's she's brilliant. Just almost like a mime performance, and the way she just looks disdainfully at everyone all the time. <laughs> I just love this shot here. She's walking down the street, got the red yeah. just bursting out of the window. That's that's really good photography. I love the lighting here. Yeah, and, and, and also and, the use of... Um, I, he looks like Felix the Cat to me. That looks like Felix the Cat. He does, he um, does, yeah. But going on about, like... Um, I just want to say before, at the time when this was all happening, again, I'm, I'm just sort of, I guess, correlating what's happening in the real world and, and, and whatever. Cause I'm inter I like the way culture seeps into, into films and stuff. And I think that... I mean, mm. that's how they're kind of made but like remember at this time in 1991 the united states was going through like a massive recession um and uh um and uh yeah like here you've got like uh the bad guy is is this guy who's running um uh a department store and consumer confidence was really down as well so like i i think that's kind of ironic you know it's kind of it's, it's obviously <laughs> tapping into um to something i think this film very much like not just um style but i think it's very much a response to kind of 80s you know the kind of excessive uh mainstream oh, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 and i mean and here you've got somebody your bad guy who's dressed like a you know a cliche kind of uh uber goth um <laughs> with white base makeup and and vinyl uh blowing up a department store i mean how unsubtle can you get <laughs> you know it's, yeah. it's 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 you know again just 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 so many uh layers i do love this love this moment here we just a really very really quick punch yeah, yeah and throws a guy and then and um, there's like three shots I mean, here in this whole sequence isn't there what there's one two three and then four five <laughs> <laughs> Six, well, because Tim Burton seven, did address in the, his own his, his commentary, didn't he? Where you know people were upset that Batman killed that guy, yeah, yeah. but he said the explosion itself is kind of comical. It's a bit Chuck Jonesy, you know, isn't it? Yeah. Um, bit, a bit, this bit was cut out of the UK one, yes. where she puts the um, the aerosol cans in the microwave. I was just going to say that's or the spray paint or something. Yeah, yeah, that bit, that the aerosol cans definitely. Yeah. I remember that being yeah. cut out. But yeah, that guy that just got blown up, that was nine shots. Now, if you watch a Christopher Nolan or a Zack Snyder action sequence, 
Could you imagine mm. the entire action scene done in nine shots? <laughs> it would be impossible for them, especially Zack uh, Snyder. You know, you'd have to be like 50 out of that. <laughs> yeah. And look at how colour drained this is too. And this is a very Victorian outfit that he's got dressed as well, uh, the penguin. This is, this is a sequence they pushed heavily. Like for the, for the, when, when on TV they talked about the movie, this this clip was always shown. He's always like, what do you want? You know, sort of that, ah, oh, the direct approach. You know, that bit. I, as a kid, I just memorised all this dialogue. Um, and Keaton looks great here in the mask. You know, it's all about the eyes, wasn't it, for Burton uh, with, with Michael. He's got jet blue eyes with a black makeup around him. Now, there's a bit coming up, isn't there, Tim? You've done a little, quite a crafty little edit um, showing you, well, it demonstrates the explosion, but they sort of, the editor threw in some oh, yeah. extra shots on the uh, street battle. Yeah, watch this, watch this in slow motion. Um, you'll just see that shot, that shot, that <laughs> shot, that shot. These, these, there's lots of shots here, as you say, that are taken from that, 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 the, the first part of this sequence, um, just to beef it up. And you can see as well that they've cropped it, because I, I think the visual effects were shot in the Vista Vision, the, bo the were, boss film, yeah. who usually, as you know, usually go the whole hog with 65 millimeter. Um, and yeah. they've cropped that explosion shot to get a tighter shot. So they've, yeah, they've, they've cropped it and you can kind of see the resolution has diminished a bit, but it's just so clever. Mm. Um, generally the editing in this film, and this seeds into this whole sequence here, uh, beautiful music, but you'll notice that the way that the film is shot, um, the way Burton shoots, it's like comedy. Um, and a lot of the time he's quite unusual in that when he shoots his close-ups. He has the he gets the actors as close to the eye line as possible. So if you look at them, they're mm. almost looking directly. They're almost nearly looking in the lens. And often when he films, uh, there's stuff in American Cinematographer about this. But he'll literally have the camera right in front of somebody's face, um, and they'll have a piece of tape on the side of the map box near the lens, <laughs> and, the, and 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 that's where they've got to imagine the actor is, so they can get onto it. Um, and he likes these from animation as well, and he likes these kind of wider shots too, where you're seeing geography and. Visual humour. He's very, very good at visual humour as well. Um, this film was edited by Chris Liebenson, who was uh, Tony Scott's editor on uh, on, on uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2 um, and uh, Days of Thunder, uh, Top Gun as well. He was one of those guys. Oh, right. it, it, that was kind of what he does really well. And he'd done Hudson Hook, which had been written by Daniel Waters before this. Yes, um, that's right, which is a massive disaster. But it? it's like action editing. Um, I just want to say too quickly as well, like if you look behind them here when they're on this ledge, stood up Batman and Catwoman, you, you see behind them, there's this, it looks like a hotel, a kind of romantic room uh, with, a, with a lamp in the middle of it. Uh, and again, mm. it's suggesting what this scene is actually about, and it's a, it's it's romance. It's a date. It's well, say it's a sexualized yeah, moment yeah, yeah, between yeah. them two, you know. And he's letting her do it, but then he, you know, he's like, oh, okay, I'm not enjoying this, and suddenly she stabs him right in the gut. But they're right, they're right outside a window, you know, um, and it's suggesting that they're almost inside it. When they, when she falls, then did you look to the side? There's two pe random people sat on balconies. I didn't... No, I didn't see that. That's very quick though, because they don't. Because that whole sequence is just cut, and, you know, it's all covered in extreme close-ups. Only the beginning of that sequence to the end, there's a wide. Yeah, as, as, as she's falling to the left, there's these people, yeah, just kind of sat there. I don't know if they're meant to be in the shot or if they're the sound recordist and the uh, boom operator or whoever. Um, yeah, a bit weird. This is the bit I love as well because it's seeing Batman, but in Bruce Wayne character. You know what I mean? It's like you don't see, you never see Batman talking like. Bruce, you know, in the suit, mm. um, which I think is quite cool. Because I think there's some, some behind the scenes stuff and they're kind of him, Michael with, with Tim, I just sort of, um, sort of ad-libbing and sort of trying to think of how they should do this scene. And there's a fascination, isn't say. there, just like looking at him because he says, oh, you know, he's got this nail, this thing in the side of him. Oh, it, does it hurt? Oh, not really. Uh, and you think, <laughs> what's he thinking? And that's sort of the joy of this character is looking at him and trying to work out what's going on in his head. It's so much more interesting than him making speeches and talking and being very verbal. This was another promotional shot for the film, wasn't it? Um, yes, it was, stairs. yeah. Um, it was very much like the, sort of the, the press, the lobby card sort yeah. of imagery. And again, this is very, very, this feels very in line with Heathers too and, and, and Daniel Waters, um, especially when the, uh, the, the young woman comes and he slips the badge on. Um, yeah, he like pushes it into her chest. Yeah. And, and the line, you know, uh, you're you're the, uh, what is it, you're the hottest role model uh, a young person could have. 
That's right, yeah. yeah. Now, also, there's another sort of, I suppose you could say it's a plot hole to a certain degree, is how did the sort of <clears throat> Red Circus gang get hold of the plans for the Batmobile? Well, it's a really bit, it's a quite a clunky bit of exposition too, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. And that's a kind of problematic sort of thing. There's always been a thing with Tim Burton for me. It's like there's certain movies he's done where he's he's totally in love with, with the story and the film. Things like Ed Wood. Um, and what was the one? I think it was, is it Big Eyes? The one with, mm-hmm. um, that was, I love that movie. And there's some films, in particular with this, where he kind of, I get the sense that he kind of loses interest in the film to a certain degree. He's kind of gets get lost, too lost in the visuals. And in terms of the continuity of the story and things, try to make sense of things, they sort of fall slightly by the wayside. Yeah. Um, I think what you said too about the plans for the Batmobile, it feels mm. like they needed to, this scene basically has to show that Catwoman wants to team up and they're putting a plan in motion and rather than her saying we should get the you know having to lead to another scene we should get his batmobile we should do something with batman it shows that something's in motion and just by just showing those blueprints on on the wall they kind of don't have to do anything else at that point because as you say with the kind of logic of burton stuff it's like um i imagine like if christopher nolan had made this film or somebody who's a bit more maybe tech obsessive they probably would have mm. gone into the science of all of that stuff and really rationalised Well, yeah, because because Batman Begins, there was always just like there's, there's 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 a clear reason why how things work and how he gets things, and you know it's not like he can make the Batmobile. He has to get the Batmobile from like a you know it's like a it's like prototype technology, and and in this film, it's they they do show more of like they, well, there's a quick scene of Bruce Wayne trying to repair the Batmobile, so it's kind of implied that he's made it himself. Um, he's not outsourced anything, you know. Yeah, and it all seems, it does seem like weirdly believable, which is... Because it's, it falls into, as you say, some of the fantastical elements of this movie with essentially with the origins of Penguin and Catwoman because you were saying, you know, well, maybe we said before this, but Penguin is cold-blooded, you know, lived in yeah. these cold conditions in the sewers. That, you'd be dead, you know, you couldn't live, you know. Um... Yeah, let's address that. I mean, there's no beating around with this. It's kind of... The character, he, he's, he's, he's the child of, of two human parents um, and he's a person with disabilities. He's got like t- two digits on his hand. Um, he's got mm. psychological issues. He's got vis- visible differences. Uh, I think if you, I, I remember this is 1992, so this is a different time, but like we were talking before about like the witches uh, before yeah. the new Robert Zemeckis one, the controversy kind of surrounding that too with the way it sort of negatively, you know, it portrays people with disabilities as being uh, uh, evil. Um, yes. And um, I think like with this, because it's creating a fantasy fable kind of world that alludes to carnival freak shows from 100 years ago to john merrick and the 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 elephant man um and i think uh because it's kind of like so fabulized and and also because uh, you know as you said the pen uh oswald cobb himself he gets thrown into icy waters at the beginning uh which would be really highly improbable that someone would survive that and then end up living on a diet of fish and, and and then bleeding green <laughs> yeah. blood, you know, like it's 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 an element of the fantastical. Um, it's so yeah. far out there, and it's kind of like what we were saying with like the difference between Anne Hathaway's uh, version of the of, of the High Ground Witch in in the Witches and the one that Angel the Angela Houston and the Anne Hathaway one, in that the Angela Houston mm. one looks so alien that it doesn't yeah. really uh, other anyone, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I always find it sort of. So well, it is. It's very problematic when people refer to him as a, uh, you know, a, a, a deformed man. Um, but again, even that terminology and freaks and stuff, because it's part of it, that kind of looking back. It's it's basically like Tim Burton is in his mind and his worlds that create. It's it's like the point of view of a boy in Burbank in the sixties, isn't it? When mm, exactly. when I guess yeah, yeah, inclusion yeah. and all all these other things, they were kind of different. People were watching stuff 
from decades before then, you know, music halls and stuff. And um, this, this, this scene here, um, you notice with uh, Selena, where she, she's looking out a window, all these people looking out of windows, she's looking out a window, and it's got like a small doll at the bottom of it that's looking back at her, and I think that's fascinating. I think that's really, really interesting. <laughs> I like it because you can see, you can see Michael in the reflection, just standing there looking at her with his shades on, yeah. uh, before he sort of approached her. So he's, just, he's been watching her as well. So I, this, I like these moments here. All the moments with, with, with Keaton and Pfeiffer, it's, um, I think it's the strongest aspects of the film. I think nails it on the head uh, with their relationship. I think, that's a, I think it's a stronger relationship in this film than it was with the Vicky Vale and Keaton in, uh, sorry, and Bruce Wayne in the original one. And it's also interesting that obviously Sean Young was going to be Vicky Vale for the original one, obviously she broke her leg and she was desperate to be in this film to play Catwoman and didn't get the part. Obviously there's that story where she's, you know, went into the office of the producer or someone at Warner Brothers dressed as Catwoman. Um, if you look at Sean Young at that point in time, she would have been so good in the first film because her look fits that world, I think. Um, and her costume they ended up using in the, kind of, she looks kind of like Anne Hathaway in, in the Batman film in, in Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, yes, yeah, and um, and also there, there was another lady cast, wasn't there? Annette Benning for Catwoman. Annette yeah, Benning. Yeah, that's when she became, she fell pregnant. Um, and she, you look at the photos of her; she she you know would have been, would have been a great Catwoman. But I don't think anyone can deny that. I think F Michelle Pfeiffer was just like perfect casting. I think for this for this story. Yeah, yeah. The Ice Princess basically is a retread of. Uh, Jerry Hall's character in the first film, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. The supermodel, the, the person who represents all the glamour, being the most beautiful person. Um, and I, I, I think I think there's nothing... Uh, the other thing I was going to say is about darkness. Um, people often say this is a dark film. And for me, I think, as I kind of said to you before, I think like the, in terms of morality, because it's so grey in many places, um, mm. that makes it a bit more mature and maybe that's a bit darker but i think like in terms of the actual violence on screen and things that happen i mean in the first film you've got a kid watching his parents getting gunned down at point blank and and you also have jerry i mean the, the whole thing with the uh, alicia jerry hall's character in the first one where she's got acid thrown on her face and and that mm. sort of happens off camera and and she's walking in unconscious like she's drugged that's 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 really dark that's really, I find that actually Yeah, yeah you're right. I, I think in terms of, okay, yeah, with, with the action and the violence, it's, as we sort of highlighted earlier, there is, has a more of a wacky element so that sort of dilutes some of that threat. Um, I, I think in terms of people criticising it for being too dark, it's generally just down to sort of the visual elements, I think, really, and, and the penguin himself, and, you know, as he's, the blood all pours out of his mouth at the end. I think on a sort of, very simplistic sort of viewpoint if you look at them side by side you you may jump to the conclusions that batman returns is a far darker more violent movie where in, in if you start sort of picking it apart you, you can see that the first film is actually kind of a little bit more um adult in terms of its um content i think well i think like the second one there's such a cynicism that's kind of layered mm. over the top of it a kind of dark i mean i think it's utterly you know it's 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 without uh redemption in 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 that the worst people in this film really are the cobble pots who are on screen at the beginning paul rubens Pee Wee herman by the way is plays plays the dad we didn't pick that up earlier i'm sure somebody's <laughs> already written down that down in the comment section um you know and um yeah it's it's like that idea of like ha throwing away your own child um, mm. Even though, as we said, he's a sort of fantastic, he becomes a sort of fantastical being, um, and there's less of a reality to it. It's just that fundamental idea is horrible. This idea of um, somebody being, uh, you know, the, the voice of Gotham, the, the the person who speaks right in, in in Max Shrek, who actually pushes his vulnerable secretary out of a window, you know, those and that things, these nasty things happening in the shadows um that are kind of way where you wouldn't expect them like in the first one it's gangsters being nasty to each other it's nasty people doing nasty things to each other whereas in this it's a bit more uh, it's a bit more kind of it's got a more cynical viewpoint and i think that is darker definitely mm. this is great too isn't it this um i read uh one of the drafts this happened uh, initially they wrote this to happen in the ballroom 
sequence. They had they so they oh, yeah, really? yeah 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 they're doing all that stuff. They moved it around. I I think. Um, because they then obviously shifted it to the, you're you're referring to the ballroom dance where they're not wearing yeah the masks, masquerade correct bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 which is actually a, which is also just a wonderful scene as well I think that works well you know there's something really um, yeah they actually literally mentioned duality in this scene too um, but mm. it's it's um, I like how when they were talking about like Ted Bundy and 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 making real they're, they're, and Vicky being an ice skater's name they're, they're, uh, and kind of laughing at it. Um, I, I like that even though they are the outsiders, they're still judging people too. Again, that greyness, um, just because yeah, they're not yeah, in yeah. the mainstream and they're not, you know, they're not the cool people, doesn't mean they can have their flaws and look at other people and 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 you know make bad comments or or whatever. I, you know, I like all that. I love the screwballness too here too. You were saying before how these two characters, Bruce and Selena, they have more in common than uh, Kim Basinger's character Vicky Vell in the first film, who. Yeah, who is almost like so. a protagonist, isn't she, in the first one, really? Well, yeah, she also, you know, with her look and style, she feels a little bit more contemporary, like a like a contemporary woman sort of thrown into the past as well. Yeah, um, but it's like with her being, um, you know, this kind of, she's like an outsider, but she's she's very, I mean, she's Kim Bassinger, you know, she's she's like one of the yeah. icons of the 80s. Uh, you know, she's very much associated with like glamour and, and uh, you know, and, and the Mickey Rook film and those kind of things. And, um, mm. and uh, My Stepmom's an Alien where she, you know, she's turning up and she's really classically, obviously classically beautiful, a head turner kind of thing. And uh, But she becomes like a very, uh, for these films where everyone else is weird, she becomes an audience's entry point. Whereas in this film, they kind of went, screw it. <laughs> you know, let's make the let's make the inverted commas weirdos. Let's make them the the, the the protagonists, the people leading it. I love I love the moment here, the contrast of them yeah. preparing to to transform. Where hers is just like this kind of shitty little car. She's got everything in a handbag or like a bag, or the, the suit is. Where Bruce has got everything all perfectly lined up. It's all like meticulous. It's all very kind of flashy. It reminds me of the um, um, you know of the Warner Brothers stores that they used to have in the nineties. Oh, yeah, it kind of yeah. looks like that, and it's all monochrome and great. <laughs> you, you know this bit here when the Batmobile turns up. Oh, I know Danny Elfman had said in an interview that he was he thought the sound mix on this was too much in favour of the effects, but I love the musical sound mm. of the shields as they go across. Oh yeah, I, I, this is CG, isn't it as well? Yeah, I'd love to yeah. just have those. Yes, these are CG. In the first film, it was artwork. It was two dimensional yes, artwork, right. whereas this was actual. And it's again, it doesn't look. <clears throat> You know, it's not the greatest CGI, but it's it fits the film so well. It's so well art directed that it, it it blends into the shadows and it just looks great. You know, it really works. I think the one thing they did with the Batmobile to add a new gadget was, I didn't I felt didn't work was when the sort of the big cylinder thing pops up pops underneath the car so it can spin around. That sort of you know lifts up in the air. I don't know where would that fit within the car. You know, you know, you know so, what? Again, I was reading another draft earlier, and apparently. At the end of this, you know, the big chase sequence at the end of here. Oh, in fact, I'll mention it. I'll mention it later. But yeah, let's keep keep that in mind. Um, there's th this shot here of Batman peering down. This is a forced perspective shot from what I remember. It's a miniature that they built and they just got someone in a Batman costume to stand and look down at it. And they just lit, wow. they lit it up. Um, don't you? I mean, I, I love... Again, I love this visual storytelling. I love that there's huge amounts of time on screen where you're just hearing operatic music playing. Um, yeah, yeah. I just, I, 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 I don't disagree with Danny Elfman. Um, um, but there is, there, I, this, I think the score does get its get its dues in this film. There's a lot of just like music's full swing, you know, in a lot of it. Um, it's not, you know, cut back. No, this is a great set as well. I wonder where they shot this. It looks like a lot. I was always, I always thought this fight scene was a little bit clunky. I was never too, like, because it's all kind of covered again with a lot of close-ups. Um, kind of, but the rhythm is so great. I mean, it's, again, mm. I just mentioned before about uh, Chris Chris Liebenson. Oh. It's high fiber, you oh, know, yeah, on yeah. the floor. Yeah, she hisses at him like a cat. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. And the mean, crunchy sound effects. Um, but Chris Liebenson, the um, the editor, uh, he, and he worked, he's done all of Burton's films since, except for Big Eyes. Um, yeah, and it, there's like a perfect rhythm to his edits. They're absolutely perfect. So when he does play around, when he does steal a bit from somewhere else and stick 
the footage elsewhere or what you never notice it because the rhythm is perfect and there's a lot uh, you know I mentioned before there's a lot of shots that just run on for a long time and there's a lot of scenes that mm. are played in very very few amount of shots but the rhythm is perfect so what's happening the movement of the people uh, the dialogue uh, the ca camera movement everything is 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 creating that pace it's not just the cuts uh, but then there's really fast paced stuff too that complements that as well um you know it's 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 a master class of editing he's a really great editor um this is uh, don't you think this is hilarious when she uh, this is all this is weird comical stuff isn't it and it's like the joker throwing his you know umbrella and unleashing these kind of bats and um oh, yeah. i do like i do i like this well that shot she just like... you see this shot here where there's michael murphy the mayor and it's kind of like yeah. it's craning down here. It's shot, that's yeah. comedy. That's a comedy <laughs> shot. That's a reaction <laughs> shot. Um, uh, uh, so much symbolism. I love that the statues. You notice they've got their faces down. And later on, yeah. in the, later on in this, earlier on in the sequence, they shoot everything. So you're seeing all the powerful side of those statues. And those statues are there at the beginning, but they just for this one bit, they have them there. And again, it, it, we got Batman lying down. Uh, on this balcony and there's a ch cherub to the side of him uh, and there's some flowers and then we've got again that whatever it is that hotel suite thing in the background the romantic room and that feeds us those details tell it they set the tone of what's happening and um, and we're about to see mistletoe in that too so it, like it without say without them doing anything really i mean they're laying on top of each other she, you know she could be she could be laying on top of him uh, in another location that's not dressed and the you wouldn't get the subtext of it immediately. Whereas with this, mm. because it's all visually laid out on there, it because yeah. you know it becomes basically a bedroom scene. This is a bedroom scene, uh, even though they're mm. lying outside. It's re it's really just. I, I I mean I love filmmaking like that. I love visual stuff, um, and I love that Tim Burton brought a lot. He put a lot of that in vogue. You know, obviously he didn't create it. People have been doing that that's cinema it goes back but it's just it's it's such a pleasure and there's so much to learn um when you watch this stuff i think um get so much out of watching his his stuff over and over and over again it's so gifted i love the look of keaton it's like you stabbed me again mm -hmm. and then i love this bit here with the as a kid seeing this in a trailer on tv one of the tv spots just seeing the 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 back cape become this glider yeah yeah uh, if, you, if, if you hit on your search engine georgia o'keefe new york Georgia, look at this shot here. That's basically a recreation. That almost looks exactly like uh, Georgia O'Keeffe artwork. Georgia O'Keeffe was an artist who influenced uh, Bo Welch on this film. Uh, also, another one is Charles Sheila. Uh, if you look at their work on New York, yeah, Georgia O'Keeffe uh, and Charles Sheila, you can see they haven't just imitated Anton First from the first film. They've kind of got to the psychology a bit different. You know, mm. they, they've, they've come, they've come, to, they've come from a different place psychologically. Uh, and I think it really, uh, it really works with that. I love this moment here because he obviously now thinks he can, get, you know, um, get a bit closer to Catwoman. She's like, I wouldn't touch you to scratch you. you know? And when he holds, Great he, holds a, he holds a ring, doesn't he? I think, oh, I don't know. Cause yeah she kind of it's, it, the camera doesn't cover yeah. it you just see her it, holding yeah, something and that. she just kind of throws it doesn't she yeah it has to ring yeah, yeah. I never really paid, I never there's no close up of it or anything but you know no. what they're saying like that's quite that's quite bold like uh, to do yeah. that and it's not even in focus there but you know I always yeah it's always felt like something else she had, she had like a it was like the, the top of the bottle of the wine you know the, the cork you know yeah because um, he's he, uh, this next bit, by the way, is 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 the sequence with the uh, Zoptic system was used. Oh, what is with the Zoptic stuff? I, I, I'm right. pretty sure. I, I'd read about it. Um, I think Zoran Perisic had, had had said in an interview that basically because of the reflective costumes uh, and because you need to light Catwoman, uh, you know, with 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 lots of light, etc. Uh, if they used blue screen, they'd get fringing. They'd get blue at contamination going into the suit so what they did is they shot with front projection so that was shot as front projection they front projected in the blue uh, I think I think if I'm, if I'm getting it wrong then please correct me so I think that's what they did and then in post they then composited the the background optically does that make sense ah, yeah it makes sense yeah, yeah. Um, oh, this is great I love this shot too the rhythm of this shot this is <laughs> these are just shots that you just remember aren't they and they're just with you yeah, oh yeah I remember that I love the bit was it's just all their hair just coming out of the uh a little mask yeah um in the uh so in one of the scripts that i read i kind of went through them online there's like there's an early draft from like 
spring 1991 and there's one that's from probably just before filming which looks which has got wesley strix kind of revisions and stuff in it um yeah. and actually in that one they have the bat store that i mentioned at the beginning the batman mobilia story is, is in there but in the earlier one at the end of this sequence it's really if i if i remembered correctly that what you said before about you know that that device that makes the batmobile turn around that kind of hydraulic thing yeah. that slams into the ground and psh, psh, turns around so at the end of this um for what i remember batman nearly instead of hitting the old woman he nearly hits a uh, a young woman and then i think that that device penguin makes that device start spinning round and round and round and round um and then batman somehow gets the batmobile to drive to a kind of uh, body shop and um, there's a, a young man working there who's kind of I think he's got Batman comic he's reading a Batman comic like it's self-referential he's actually reading a Batman oh really yeah because uh, they because I know they're supposed to introduce well there, there was ideas of introducing Robin well, well, wasn't well this is it um, oh right so basically okay. he, they um, somehow Robin gets the car suspended up in the air so it stops Penguin's device and then Batman punches the screen, I think. And then he talks to Robin and they end up driving away somewhere. And then Robin gets out, wipes oil from his uh, top, from like, you know, the breast on his uh, on his top. And you can see an R. Oh, so, yeah. right. And I want to say just about this, this with the car chase here, Gotham City in general. So in the first mm. film, they built that massive set in Pinewood, as we know, huge. And it wasn't yeah. an Oscar, it was massive. And it's got a real sense of scope and scale and they show it off so much. Um, and you know, I've heard people like Kevin Smith mention things like the Monarch Theatre because you can see an elect a big sign saying Monarch Theatre. It gives away the geography of it so you know that it's a kind of small set. You know, if you've watched the yeah. film millions and millions of times over and over. Um, and that's the kind of thing where you've got those big sets and you show them off and really make them impressive. It means that, you know, once you've done that, you can't really see too much. And um, whereas on this film, what they've done, they've gone the reverse way in that I think that they, for the, these, you know, these chase sequence and whatever, this, I think this is on a standing New York set that was at Warner Brothers where they like did the, yes. where they did the intro for like the, um, you know, the Friends TV show. They did the intro for that. Um, and, yeah. and, and the beginning of Gremlins 2 where you see Chinatown. It's used quite a lot. And I think in Lois and Clark, I'm sorry, I might be, I think it's a bigger, you know, it's a bigger set than that, but it's roughly kind of that thing, I think. And I think, I think they've decorated it. I think that's what they've done. They may have built it from scratch. I'm, I'm not sure. My point is, what yeah. the, the thing that they've done in this film, if you look when they were going down this street, backwards and forwards, at the top of it, there's like an archway with a, an electric sign with an arrow on it. And in some scenes, they've just turned it off. They've literally just turned it off. Um, and then oh. and then they've like covered the, um, you know, the arch entrance. Um, and then in some scenes, they've, they've had it exposed. And in some scenes, they've put up different, you know, they've, they've um, taken the sign down completely. And anyway, because there's such a minimal amount of sign dressing everywhere, uh, it means that you don't recognize anything. So in your, yeah, in exactly, your mind, yeah. you just think this is a maze of lots of streets that all look the same. Whereas in Batman, everything was so distinct. Everything was designed like it was by a different architect. Um, oh, this this sequence, by the way, this this uh, miniature shot. This was done by the Skotak brothers, uh, who won an Oscar for Aliens, and uh, one of them won an Oscar for Terminator Two as well. Uh, and then the Gee, it's the one bit where Batman talks to the audience, isn't it? Kind of, he sort of breaks the fourth wall, and that's another one you, you yeah. were saying before about when people are whispering in this film, mm. and then because he says he looks at the camera, and goes, "It's funny." Yeah. And then he just goes, okay, what well, now I'm worried. Yeah. And then he flicks the thing and it all just goes into a rocket. But, which I wish they did release as a toy, but I never saw that in the shops. That that, that Batmobile toy. He almost sounds like he's saying alloyed or something. I remember as a kid just thinking, is he talking in tech speak? Again, it's stuff you, you pull out later. Um, we mentioned in the first Batman that um, when these films came out, I remember the plots and the whole thing of, of um, Joker having the parade uh, and getting everyone together on the float and kind of doing his us versus them thing with Batman. And here with the mayor thing, I remember like growing up and being told, yeah, these Batman films are entertaining, but they've got really, really bad plots and they're really predict it's really cheesy and, and uh, you know, the plots are not good. And, and um, you know, the idea of Penguin becoming mayor, oh, that's a bit, uh, you know. 
Um, they don't really fit into what's going on in the world. And it's kind of funny now, you know, he's talking about the glory of Gotham, bringing, you know, bringing Gotham back to where it was. And, 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 and just like these ideas of populism, you know, these kind of populist ideas. Um, I, I think it's kind of funny again that, that, that now it, it doesn't, you know, it probably seems less trivial now than when it was released you know in, in in some ways maybe i don't know yeah. i just i just think again that's one of those zeitgeisty things where i'm kind of like that's really you know also there's a line here you know they threw in about you know letting vicky van into the back cave and i do like this sort of you know the flick the switch to uh go to the back cave yeah yeah but it's, it's a little bit a bit too much faff though every time he's got to put his hand in that in the fish tank to do it I, I really like the uh, the set of Wayne Manor. I really do. I think um... this one actually there's another bit where he early on when he was talking to Alfred to sort of try and think of a reason to sort of say why he was leaving Selena there. Uh, it, the design actually is, feels reminiscent of the what they used in Batman Forever. Okay. It's it's such a because the Wayne Manor we saw of the. Well, the the first film was actually an existing building. It wasn't this kind of made up set. It was um, it already it was already there. So I think it's such a radical change come the, the sequel, but it feels more like a I suppose American architecture. Yeah, than... rather than being Nebworth and Hatfield house. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and it's it's just controlled. It looks more consistent. Um, mm. It looks more part of its own uh, world. Um, yeah, I, I, this is a great. This is a great one as well, isn't it? Too <laughs> just sort of CD mixing, isn't it? <laughs> you know, the bat CD. And it's good as well. They 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 in this in this script they deploy Alfred to do more to do to do more things, you know, to help to help Bruce with this sequence here. I think it's good. Consider this, you know, in the in the in the first film, he's just kind of either serving him stuff or he's just offering a bit of advice. I love that line. I didn't say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love how I love how Batman's recorded a clear dialogue of him talking because it's it's a it's a complete deliver uh, the, the the delivery of what he's saying is so different to what he was saying when he was being recorded. It's gr- great know. clean production audio, as you say. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It just looks so cool. I wonder now if people look at this and it, well, they probably do look at it and think it looks really goofy. I thought this held up like a lot of the tech and the design and stuff in this because it's so timeless, it kind of lasts, you know? Yeah, when you have something that is kind of a hodgepodge of different time zones, it kind of, it does ultimately make the movie a little bit, sort of stand the test of time. Um, but if it was if it was just like glaring 90s stuff all over it, it would have felt like, oh God, you know, this feels so dated. But it doesn't because you've got people wearing clothes from what appears to be like the 40s. So Yeah, um, funny you mention that actually because um, Bob, I, again, I had that making of and um, Bob Ringwood had said in that, Bob Ringwood and his co- co-costume designer on this film, Mary Vogt, who um, was his assistant, I believe, on June, um, they mentioned about nine, specifically about 1947. Because they say that was the time in which kind of affluence kind of came back to America after the after the uh, the war, um, people having money, um, and that's kind of what they wanted to get into the costumes. You see this set here of the of the park. You can kind of see the backing. You know the black backing. Yeah, uh, it's a bit too set bound. This is it's, it's a difficult thing, isn't it? When you've got snow and trying to expand it, it doesn't doesn't quite work in a set. Oh, that woman hits herself on the side there. God, that would I wonder hurt. if they're the same extras that they used for the family at the beginning. And you know yeah, what? Yeah, maybe. That would be entirely appropriate if, if it was, because that's exactly <laughs> what they're, you know, they're filling the same function. Um, <laughs> and, you know, DeVito's performance here is just fantastic. It's really good. Uh, this is another sequence where they've been playing him again as this sort of fantastical nasty the nasty edward scissorhands and and they're really this sort of does go into elephant man territory um yeah this yeah. is uh, like there's full conviction in this this isn't a comedy performance even though there is elements of comedy in it it's it's real tragedy it really is scary uh how this 
you know, this this person's been tormented by society and been on this roller coaster and that's basically that's his comeback over at this point. But I think I think DeVito is absolutely magnificent here. Did you um at the time play the Batman Returns games on the old Mega Drive or Super Nintendo? Me- the Mega Drive one, did you? Yeah, yeah, I had the Mega Drive one. It was insanely hard. I got really frustrated with that game. Um, there was a, one on the Mega CD. It had these kind of really cool sort of driving sequences, but that was, it was, you know, putting money down for a Mega CD wasn't really worth it. But I did like the Super Nintendo one, which is basically the scrolling beat em up uh, where you could, like, you know, like, like Batman does in a film, bash people's heads together, throw them against stuff. It was great. Yeah. Because, you know, this film. Yeah, you had a film that wasn't really appealing to a wide audience, I don't think, and that's why it kind of didn't perform as well, and and it was critically kind of kind of bashed in some areas. But what came with that was this kind of massive again repeat of the merchandise of the first film, and um, I it was kind of a, there was more of a disconnect, I think, with the sort of the, the products that you could buy. And how they were selling them to what the film was about is that the film, you know, the film's not wasn't designed for all these toys and, you know, things for little children. It was just his own thing, and it's not the filmmaker's fault at all. I think it's just the, uh, you know, Warner Brothers and their desperate attempts to sort of push enough to children when it really wasn't aimed at them. Yeah, it's it's just a different time, isn't it? A different era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's the thing I always kind of you know, when you look back now you think, Oh, it's a bit weird, you know, but at the time it was just like mm. just kind of accepted it and just wanted to I wanted that Batman who had a scuba suit. You yeah. know? This is this um, is an iconic scene too. This is It's like something out of Labyrinth, you know. Well it's so it's been, it's been <laughs> spoken about so look at the all seeing eye on uh, on, on Walker's yeah. hat. Um yeah, I mean, just in terms of symbolism, again, not not it's not subtle, but it's just clever and appropriate. And uh, the idea of Bruce and, and Selina being the only ones who aren't wearing the masks. Um, and they sort of repeated that beat a bit, didn't they, in um, The Dark Knight Rises? Isn't there a scene? Am I misremembering that? I haven't seen that since it came out. Isn't there a scene where they're not wearing masks at the beginning in a ball? Um, yes, there is. I, I think she's wearing a mask, okay. I think. I can't remember. God, yeah, I need to sort of. If, re- if, you, if you look up on the stairs there. here, if you look up, you, scenes just come down the stairs, and then then they mm-hmm. cut here. You, you can see that the guy. Sorry, the I should have done a bit bit of a run up on that. If you look at the wide shot when she's coming down the stairs, you'll have seen that Selena it walks behind a guy who turns around and walks up the stairs, and that guy has already turned in the long shot and walked. So I think I think they'd shot this with the intention of Selena being revealed in the wide. And in the edit room, they've gone, OK, let's let's change that. We want to have uh, Bruce's reaction. And um, and I didn't notice that for years and years and years and years. To be honest, I've gone through this frame by frame in some places because I've been in <laughs> awe of the edits. The reason and that's not to pick it apart. That's because some of the edits are so good. Um, you know, when I've been working professionally, I, I on edit jobs, I'll go through like films that are really well edited and I've gone, oh, goodness, they've played around the mess that. And a lot of direct, really good directors like uh, Spielberg is another one where if you go through frame by frame, you'll see stuff is moved around all over the place. And but that when you watch yeah. it 24 frames a second, it doesn't nobody cares. You know, that's how it's, things are supposed to do. But I just I, I really appreciate uh, that craftsmanship and that artistry. Um, and, and we've got Susie in the band. Well, we just had uh, Rick James Super Freak playing. Uh, again, not subtle. Uh, and now we're going to Susie and the, Susie and the Banshees. And that is, uh, if I've said Sushi and the Banshees at any point in this commentary, because I've been too, <laughs> speaking too quickly, I apologise. Yeah, and, and, and that's such a great song. Uh, just that underlines this whole thing face to face. It's always I had a sense that he he was... Bruce was so close to sort of redeeming her at this point where she, you know, she's possibly about to pull the gun out and he tries to sort of, you know, calm her down. And they walk off together. But obviously due to the explosion, they're sort of separated. And I think that was his kind of chance to sort of save her. But um, mostly because it's now, she, even though it's kind of obvious that they kind of know their identities, but it still still comes as a surprise to her a little bit near the end where if, I suppose it just sort of validates her her theories um, yeah well it, and also when that explosion happens it all goes silent too like Burton really knows mm. about these uh, all, 
you know the power of, of of these big explosions they kind of repeat the bit where they because they sort of reveal that they know each other at this point uh when they talk about the mistletoe and they say do we have to be fighting again do we have to start fighting and then they uh, later on they remove their mask and they sort of repeat that moment again and oddly it sort of works because it's so beautifully done uh, some, this yeah. is a really nice shot isn't it as bruce pauls this is a really it's an extreme close-up and then bruce walks back into a close-up and then it goes to matching close-ups and oh it's the film was shot by stefan uh i believe it's stefan chapsky uh who shot um of all films child play Charles Play 2, uh, which he then, I believe he then got hired to do Batman Returns on the back of that, if I'm believing something that I've read on the internet, uh, by Don Mancini, the, the, no, it's by, by Don Mancini, the director. So That's a pretty two. impressive step up, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Almost like the uh, DP of Robocop 2, you know, sort of did horror films for, for um, Cronenberg, and this goes into doing a big sequel, you know. Yeah. I, I and I kind of prefer it when the penguin is on his own with the penguins. I think it's just aesthetically nicer and less cluttered. Um, I do like this bit here because this is like this is this is a trailer shot when he comes out of the smoke. Oh, yeah. You know, it works really well. There's some really good use it's a of little smoke. slowed down. There's some really nice rhythmical stuff here too. Look. The uh, the punctuation when the the, uh, the the hat gets put on top of the duck, um, and, and I love the sound as well of the wing of the duck. It's also interesting they've made they've, they've I just noticed this they've made use of the same set f- yeah um, for the for the shopping mall bit where she smashes it all up because you can see the, the signs at the back. Um, well, it's all kind of that sort yeah. of Rockefeller kind of area. Well, the Christmas tree area is all kind of Rockefellery type, and this is sort of. Uh, Again, a kind of old New York. I love this bit here. Do you do you love this? Uh, you see the gunshot, the bullet. Some someone had to time that that explosion in the background. Can you imagine somebody yeah. sat yeah. there with with a box <laughs> being told you have to press that when Danny does this? Can you imagine if you get that wrong and it blows holes in the set. Um, should we talk about just about the, uh, the, the 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 plot as well? This firstborn plot. Uh, yes, because you'd mentioned because there's that sort of criticism about his motives, wasn't there? At a time when the press was, uh, yeah, well, I think the writer had to address it, didn't he? Well, this these ideas of it being uh, Batman. There was a few kind of criticisms. I think uh, the idea of it possibly being anti-Semitic because of, um, well, a at the beginning you got the Moses basket imagery, but uh, I think the fir- you know the the the, the firstborn sons obviously is a. Uh, uh, you know, it, it alludes to Exodus, and um, what I, th- well, I've listened to a really good um, podcast by the Southern California Public Radio. Sorry, a news article by the Southern California Public Radio, in which Wesley Strict is interviewed. Um, but basically, uh, what I believe happened in looking at some of the earlier drafts, I think that Moses basket at the beginning. I think it was just. It's not even called a Moses basket. It's called. Um, it's called the. It just says it's a carriage. In fact, it could just be the whole, you know, the the, the, the whole baby carriage <laughs> thrown in. Um, they don't really make a point of that. And then um, I think as well, I saw in in uh, Waters' draft the bit where Penguin, uh, when sorry when Oswald appears um, for the first time in Gotham City, and people part out of the way in the script, they kind of liken it to Moses. But it really isn't about mm. that. They're just kind of using the, you know, everyone knows the image of the sea parting and they're just basically saying that people are moving out of the way. Um, and anyway, Wesley Strick came in to do rewrites because Danny Waters was the original writer. And um, he sort of picked up on that Moses imagery. And, you know, to, to, to quote him, he said, I was the sole Jew on the film, you know. So I kind of <laughs> saw into that. And he said he was sat, I think he was sat in a supermarket, uh, his car outside a supermarket or something. And he kind of thought, oh, we could, because he was told they need to have a, like a coherent through line, which obviously the film is sort of lacking. Um, and so they were, they were trying to get something of that in there. And so his idea was, oh, if this, this firstborn song, this firstborn son thing then then you know that's kind of amusing and it sort of plays through sort of uh, and anyway then people read into other stuff happening in it which i don't really want to go into uh, on here you can read about that but st- articles were published in the new york uh, times and it and eventually strick actually at the time uh, he wrote into the new york times and he said look you know i came up with um, the exodus thing being you know 
but everything else you know it seems such a stretch um uh, you know and i think that you're you know the stuff that's been written about the film is divisive not the film itself uh, and that's from the writer but anyway you can take from that what you want and go <laughs> go down that rabbit hole and read about that if you know if, if, if you want to but um but yeah that sc scpr uh, website just had a an actual interview uh, audio interview with 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 strick so um go there i do love that batman has these kind of personalized sort of letters you know he's got the bat symbol yeah. on it you know he's, he's got them must have got like a discount sort of vista print or something like that he's made some t-shirts like oh do you want some <laughs> do you want some yeah. letterheads or whatever you know um i think that's i think that's quite that's a nice little bit of comedy there uh you, you notice too on these reverse shots where it's behind devito looking at the penguins yes uh yes. visual effects it's quite washed out it's quite wish, washed out that those kind of shots where he's where he's looking at the penguins I, um, see i never knew as a kid watching mm. those that there were those were visual effects i sort of buy them because there is mm. so much good art direction in this and everyone's kind of on the mm. same page in terms of the design i think that's i think the lighting changes that's the problem i think it doesn't um it looks a bit more low res yeah. i think really you know, you can tell it's just been like it's just been optically done, so there's kind of loss of resolution. Yeah. Um, See, so I, I was happy to see the the bat boat, I suppose you could call it. Um, I just don't think the, the design was as interesting as say the bat wing. It's just this it's an odd kind of an odd shape. But you don't really. I remember seeing those sort of maquette sort of kits you could get as a kid when it came out because I had I got the Batmobile as a model kit. Uh, for returns and they had the bat boat i just didn't, didn't think it looked that interesting um but it's a wonderful miniature shot though this is just really well done especially when it sort of careers up the side of it and spins up like, spins around uh, avoids the rockets and you see in the sort of the foreground on the left the two penguins um very clever and the sound effect of those penguins going the radar brilliant it's so so it's like so something out of the adam west uh, TV well, it's show. so cute, uh, isn't it? And and kitsch, and yeah. it sort of marries up with like the Felix the Cat head and everything else. So beautiful, mm. so really. Where is everyone? Where's everyone in Gotham yeah. City? They haven't gone to bed now. You know, it's kind of an empty sort of city now. It's full of penguins. Um, and you know, it's the third act sort of action sequence. You could say is I it was always it was always a letdown to me because even though they've done a wonderful sh you know wonderful work with the miniatures with the bat with the bat boat, you know. Um, it's it's a kind of a little bit underwhelming, you know, when he just sort of smashes through the thing, comes out the sewers, and um, and the penguin, you know, is tricked into firing those rockets at himself, you know, at, at his at the um, at the fairground ride, as it were, the sort of you know uh, where he lives. Yeah. Um, you know, I just know, and the bats come out as well and sort of knock him into into the glass, and he falls through into the water. I don't know. I, I, it just just lacked the sort of uh the sort of excitement of the original well i think as i say like the the problem is there's no real yeah there's no thrust like on on the first film it was batman going up against uh the you know the captor of his girlfriend who who killed his parents mm. and he and, and he and he's a, and he's about to get a helicopter isn't he as well also the joker has these sidekicks who yeah, he can take yeah. on where circus gang have now departed um, so I think they maybe they could have written a way where they stayed around where Batman has to face them off before he gets to the Joker just to sort of add a little bit more excitement to it. Yeah. Um, but I think obviously because they now feel they've it's a losing battle they're going to lose so they just all leave him. Um, and of course he showed his true colours when he shot one of them earlier for saying look this is a bit you know taking the first spawns is yeah. a bit weird you know it's, it's not right. Well, I was going to say because it's quite an intro you know you mentioned about introverts before and stuff and people being. Um kind of sat on their own and I, I i i always think i always get in my head when i ghosts or if anyone like you know if you message someone and they don't reply on social media or something and this is all pre-social media i think of that poodle lady just disappearing into black the same way that the penguin kind of looks up at her and he's hoping that she's gonna help him and it just turns to black um and, and you know there's a lot to be said about mental health and and, and these kind of things um mm. i wanted to ask you uh, or I want to put to pose that question. I think we may have mentioned this before out of here. Batman Returns as a Christmas movie. Yeah, it's, um, I suppose, Warner Brothers released it in the summer. So 
the studios don't really think it as a, think of it as a stu- as a Christmas movie. I don't think it's the same with Die Hard, where it wasn't released during that sort of Christmas schedule. But these movies sort of just always become part of Christmas for for many people. Um, I Batman Returns has never really been part of my sort of Christmas viewing schedule um because yeah, there's so many films to watch um we're also watching it now so it is um but if you take out the christmas element does it affect the story um and i suppose the only thing i can think of is like if you take out the christmas element you, you wouldn't have the ice princess bit and that that sort of element happening um but that could be used as something else another celebration um it's, it's the same as Shane Black. It's it's mm. having the Christmas element. It's often just a background thing to serve the visual element as well sometimes, or to create a little bit of um, st- nostalgia for the viewer. Well, I think thematically um, for this film, I think it really works having it. There. I think you could probably change it, but I think Christmas mm. is a time of coming together, buying yeah. presents, being seen, t- you know, what the film's really about you know the idea of being seen to be a family whereas in like the first one as we said you know you've got bruce and his parents at the beginning and they are a family or, or the the boy that gets uh, you know his parents get mugged uh, they are a family you know and and, and bruce had yeah. a family and it was a real family and they're loving and they're gone and this one it's all like smiley face families but then you know let's take our baby and throw him into icy waters because he looks different yeah, to us yeah um, yeah so yeah I, I, th- I think you're right though i think the christmas element does work you took it away it, 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 it it would be, be less effective, I think, and also visually not as striking. I don't think. Yeah. Having the snow and stuff just kind of works in its favour. Like when you have snow in a movie and it, I mean, it's not Christmas, it's kind of creates a sort of mixed message, I think. Um, yeah, and and also at the end he says goodwill to all men and women, and it's like. Yeah, I like that line. I'm well, like, it's like the old idea of yeah. us all being the same as well. Um, mm. Yeah, like I say, it's much more. Um, you know, when you get into duality, when you get into images and appearances, I think this film is much richer than the first one. I think the first one is way more accessible and more direct and better structured and, and ultimately better mm. paced. Not because of not because of cra- the craft side of it, but just because of it's a yeah. story. It's a story in its structure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, all this stuff here, like you know, you've got um, you're just jealous because you have to wear a mask and all this kind of stuff. I, I you know, I think mm. it's it's really rich. It's really good, and it really spoke. And it's a really this is a really angry, necessary film that came out at a time uh, where I think you know you having like uh, grunge was happening. Uh, you you know you have um, this idea of like uh, going against sort of materialism and 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 access and fashion and you know celebrating sort of a more underground kind of you know vibe and and uh yeah i i, I think this this there's so much to it and and it's so visual isn't it like look at all this stuff there's so much stuff just throughout this film where there's no just like it's storytelling followed by storytelling followed by visual storytelling followed by visual storytelling i just oh, I, lo- yeah. I think <laughs> maybe as well like i was thinking about this maybe it's like a generational thing i don't, I don't know something you know something you grow up with but um yeah, I, I think this speaks it's, it's to us. It's to agree. It's to agree because I've I've seen this film. I've sorry, I've shown this film to uh, other people who, who didn't grow up with Batman yeah. Returns, and they weren't particularly. They were impressed with how it looked, but they they just they just thought it was quite quite boring. Uh, ultimately, by the end, um, when they've when they've been exposed to the sort of the later Christopher Nolan films and. Um, I suppose expecting Batman to take more of a central role in these films, um, and in, and in terms of you're saying it's sort of it's the grunge music and how things were were in that sort of period of time, it is more of a twisted version of a Christmas narrative as well, Christmas kind of setting, and it's sort of, yeah, reflect of sort of that sort of. Um, uh, protest i suppose that sort of the teenage sort of attitude at the time generation x was they called generation yeah, yeah, x but also like at that time the way yeah. stuff was being forced down people's like uh it wasn't that long after i think when uh, bush did that bush senior did the campaign where he said uh, we've got to be a lot more like the waltons and less like the simpsons and at that time yeah. everything had become it was like a celebration of the dysfunctional um the yeah. simpsons yeah. The, i remember, remember watching those first episodes and you see them and they're kind of we're, everyone's laughing at it and thinking they're so awful, mm. but we're also looking at them going, that's us. You know, they're, they're, yeah, they're yeah, not, yeah. Um, you know, they're not a squeaky clean sitcom from the from the 80s where everyone's smiling and, you know, and it's all, uh, you know, throwback to kind of 
50s conservatism. It's it, you know, it's it's, it's something else, uh, and, and you get that vibe from this. You get that from Edward Scissorhands. Um, I love that that's in a superhero film as well. Mm. I love obviously well that the the backdrop for, uh, for Catwoman and Batman it was kind of Victorian style sort of you know, like power grid as it were. Um, it's kind of bouncing up on these springs, but. Obviously, here is, is sort of the biggest sort of continuity gaff, isn't it? Because we see his panda eyes disappear in one sort of cut, and to me, it always bugged me as a kid. And, and people have gone online; people have actually color corrected it and changed, and improved it, sort of, sort of show that once he pulls it off, the eyes sort of are clean. But I think Tim Burton at the time should have just had the camera start from behind Batman, and as the camera moves around, as he pulls the mask off, you see his face and the panda eyes are gone but just just showing it the the eyes appear clean <laughs> in one edit it's just like now it's just it's so awkward it just doesn't work for me um so yeah should the camera should have panned as he as it panned around him as it as he pulled it off that would have worked wonders i think mm. well i i never know to be honest when i was a kid i never noticed it then yeah i was like oh my god it's gone it's just such a <laughs> It's just as a world to get lost in. Um, I was going to say before about uh, Shrek, Max Shrek as well, and, and likening him to the Cobblepots. I mentioned before about Family Legacy and how, like, at the beginning, the pen, you know, the Cobblepots obviously don't want uh, Oswald to be their son. Uh, that's going to no, reflect no. badly on how they look, and they're looking all the time, looking at people, da da da. And then the whole thing with with Shrek is that he wants Chip to have the legacy of the the power station as well. And you'll notice that Shrek here is stood in front of a giant power generator too. Um, and in one of the drafts I read, and I might be making this up. No, I'm not making this up. I read it this morning. Come on, Tim, get with it. Um, I'm sure that, that that there's a fuse box behind, and then uh, I think that this. That this somehow links up to the lights in the tree, uh, in the uh, in the Gotham Square. They start to flicker, so everything kind of, you know, links together. I think you could have made a point of maybe when uh, you know Selina's killing, uh, when she's doing the the electrocution of Max. Maybe you could have cut to the Shrek Tower and see Chip looking out and seeing every, you know, everything lighting up as a blanket of stars. But you'd mm. have to set that up at the beginning, you know, a bit more. You'd yeah yeah you'd have to sort of create that through but that would be um, that would be great i think that would really help it i think it really sounds this is still quite a violent sequence yeah. for a 12 because he's just literally shooting it up close this he's taking those bullets and she's gone pure there's no blood um, but there's um you know. she's gone pure goth here as well mm. look the music here is great too isn't it i i you know i i'll be honest i feel like as again because because Oswald kind of has two homes in that he's got his ancestral kind of couple pot family and then he's got his penguin family and he's got his triangle family. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and that's the other thing too, like the triangle circus were the first people to exploit him as a freak, but he's complaining about society calling him a freak, but he's then using them as his... Like, I don't know, it just doesn't, <laughs> it's a bit, a bit of a leap for me. Um, yeah, when you've got so many elements flying around. But I, I wonder, what if, the, what if Penguin had died um, in the graveyard from earlier? If he, if he died next to his parents, and then the penguins had come and stood around it and looked at him, rather than having this kind yeah. of, I mean, this, this I always thought was very awkward, the, uh, the penguin procession. The music is great, Danny Elfman scores the heck out of it and it's really beautifully acted and beautifully performed and everything else but it just to me it feels like a different movie uh because we've, we've <laughs> got these kind of people dressed up little little people yeah which throughout the rest of the film you know. have looked completely flawless um they've looked yeah. like real actual penguins and then all of a sudden to give them kind of away it's like it's a bit it takes me out of it a bit and i wonder if you could have just mm. done the same thing and it i think it would have been much more like for him to uh, to be given back to you know for him to to die with the penguins in underground uh, and them all to be looking at him lovingly it kind of it's a bit mm. soft i think it would have been a bit harder and a bit more to swallow and probably would have got the, the point of the film across a bit more had he died with his parents next to that gravestone. If he, if he just collapsed like he does here with his parents and then he had the penguins going alongside him, um, I think it would have probably resonated a bit more because then they, they're left with something that they wanted to run away from, you know, yes. on full view. Yeah. That would... I suppose, if you look at it like, because Penguin sort of resented him so much, 
having him sort of die where his parents' grave is. I don't know. It's um, it may go against what his attitude was throughout the film. I see because he was only pushing the angle that he was, you know, he you know missed his parents as a sort of ploy to get in, to get sympathy from the public but, but you can um, see i think but this is it you can definitely see in those mm. scenes where he's talking about how he wanted to meet his parents that that again it's this gray thing it's not like uh he may you know he's after the we know that he, he wants the names of the firstborns at that point but we also mm. i think that's genuine i think he really does feel that pain and i think that mm. that's what makes it, again sort of grey. You can at the same time you can be angry and scheming and planning some nasty death for everyone in Gotham, while also mourning the fact that you never knew who your family were. You can be doing. We're yeah. complex. We're humans. We you know. We're, and again, this is where it's much more sophisticated than the first film, where it's just like, "There's Jack. He's bad. He's just bad. Dead." <laughs> you know. Hey, look. There's that red sign I told you about again. The arrow sign in yes, the tunnel. Yes, that's right. Driving yeah. down the. See, they do it. They, they've driven down this street about six million times in this film, and you'd never know. Uh, <laughs> and and you mentioned before about the Shrek store. When you've got that Shrek sign up there, like because the film yeah. takes place like narratively, it has to take place at Shrek's, and Shrek's a character. There's a reason for them to be in that recurring place. Oh, don't you love that? Don't you love the shadows? I love that in, shadow, but yeah, it's, and it's great. in the corner as well. It's like, again, a kind of alluding to introverts and stuff, but like the, the idea of somebody in the shadows, somebody who's interesting in, in the shadows and not out making great speeches and being, you know, at the front. It's a real kind of, yeah, it's brilliant. It's, 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 and he, you know, obviously it's also her cat and she, and he takes the cat with her, with him. And um, obviously the camera pans up, isn't it? It's that really expensive last minute shot they threw in which cost a which they did over a weekend or something like which that which i believe was yeah. was was a mandate from i believe that was a note from the studio um yeah i, I remember yeah. reading that in cine fantastic and i think in uh i think it's in the making of as well i think they actually say it's a studio yeah note. it did because they've got like also is they i think they do point out like when catwoman sort of pops up in the frame it's like what she's standing on <laughs> you know you don't know what you know um you know what sort of part of the building she's on but it's you know you've got this kind of motion control i think it's over a miniature and opticals and all sort of everything thrown in to sort of make it look as good as possible over a sort of very short period of time yeah and it's to do it's it matt world it cost a fortune yeah, it's matt world yeah. who, uh, who, who... But this thing is like two hundred forty five thousand dollars. i think it might have cost you know that's what happens when you want something at the last minute you know yeah i i i really like again just the message of the film and and that it's saying you know don't be judging and looking and worrying about fitting in and conformity and fashion and just you know we're, we're they're, they're they're we're all really the same and we shouldn't judge and i, I you know i, I it, it can be interpreted many different ways um mm. but it's 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 so it's so human and um and it's so expressionistically done um yeah this film is just a massive delight uh even though it has its problems, it's still you know I I I I can look over them because they're it's just so original. Yeah, yeah, it's it's still it's still an enjoyable film. I I I I never disliked it. I just kind of I loved it as a kid for just because it was just Batman again, you know, and seeing a new film. And it was just over the time over the years, I sort of kind of drifted away from it because of its kind of script issues and. And it's kind of Tim Burton's kind of focus to really kind of um, spend more time with the villains than the actual hero of the piece. And, you know, there's always an argument like Batman should be in the shadows. He can he speaks less. He doesn't want to be the centre of attention. And he's kind of in the background doing things. But I, I always felt that Batman, if it's about Batman, it sh it sh he should be front and centre. And, 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 and that's what we saw with the, the later films with Nolan behind the camera. Um, and also we used to be, you know, just the Batman video games at like the Arkham ones where you are playing as Batman and, and, but they've all got these kind of very kind of very deep, interesting stories that deploy the villains in a very good way. And it's like the animated show as well, where Batman mm. is the center and, but there's time dedicated to the villains and, um, and these movies though are, you know, visually striking and interesting. There's a lot to sort of pick away, pick apart there and, and find really interesting sort of nuggets of, um, you know where Burton was going with it and what he's been inspired by um, ultimately it, then they just didn't quite hit the mark for me anyway over the years of 
giving me a true kind of Batman film. And and as some and I I know I reviewed Batman Returns years ago, and and it's interesting hearing what the fans say about it. Like, this is a true Batman movie. This is, it's just like the comics. I'm like, well, what comics have you been reading? Because this is not what I've read, you know. Mm. Um, and it is, and as, as as the writer has said in in in, in interviews where he's like it's not a Batman movie it's a Tim Burton movie and it is a Tim Burton movie but doesn't doesn't that doesn't mean you can't enjoy it for what it is and um, and I think it's got a lot of, lot of strong aspects but it, it's to sort of look at it as a as a Batman fan it sort of uh, it doesn't quite deliver mm. I feel like uh, I always feel like with these if it's a you know really interesting film it's like we press record and then it's over and you sat there thinking, oh my goodness, what haven't I just spoken about? Um, it felt like this went by really quickly and there's probably times... It did, it did. Probably times where maybe I'm a little jumping too ahead of myself, you know, because I'm just so excited uh, and, and, and desperate to try and cram everything in. And, um, because Tim, because you said, you know, like at the time you didn't, you know, quite like it, but as, as obviously over the years, as you've begun to sort of, as you got older, you sort of understood more of its themes and its kind of ideas and what, and the sort of the, just the sort of the, the craftsmanship of the movie, you've obviously appreciated it a lot well, you more. you change as well, don't you, as a you, you mature. Yeah, you do, don't you? Um, yeah. And I, I, don't get me wrong, I'm fully aware of its flaws, as, you know, as are you. Um, but there, I, I, you know, I wouldn't dismiss it. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to say, actually quickly, um, just about Tim Burton, and this is kind of just an interesting thing that I thought about in Tim Burton, and then Joel Schumacher took over, obviously, with the next two films. Tim Burton, you know, the ideas of Tim Burton, it's kind of like the idea, you know, we were saying before, this guy from Burbank who likes Harryhausen movies and um, and, and likes uh, kind of classic American uh, cinema and um, likes that kind of artifice and expressionism and, and being the idea of being trapped inside one's own mind um, and wrestling with kind of... You know, it, these ideas that he has, in, you know, themes in his films. Um, and Joel Schumacher, by contrast, um, you know, he, he, from what I gather, he wasn't an introvert. He was very much an extrovert. He was a costume designer. He was a writer. Uh, you know, he lived in New York. You know, he, 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 he was out partying all the time um, in, in, in very kind of, um, you know, in very kind of popular areas and stuff. And I, I just wonder maybe when people say like Tim Burton, Again, we're just playing with ideas, but like the the idea of is Tim Burton Batman? Is he those characters? And then looking at Joel Schumacher, I'm kind of like I, I you know I can see how the psychology might be different. Um, you know, two two different people from two different backgrounds, and I wonder how much of that feeds into the film. I mean, I I think that Batman Returns is a much better story. Uh, it's much more coherent than um, these two, and it's got it actually is about one thing. Um, with that psychology and um, actually having a psychologist as a character as well in it too it's very clear but it's not as I don't think it's poetic I don't think it's I don't think it's as rich I don't think that it kind of goes in and, and Batman is a guy who's bereaved uh, Bruce Wayne is bereaved and he's going into his own mind and and um, there's a Tim Burton world you know and um, yeah. yeah I don't know that's just an, what do you think well in terms of a comparison to what forever and the changes yeah, and just like where they've come from. Well, yeah, I suppose, yeah, because Forever is a complete reaction from the studios to say, look, it's a, it's a complete like checklist of what we need to do to sort of you know, appease the marketing people and, 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 and turn things around. Um, and, and there's still darker elements in Batman Forever. Um, and it's just a, it's such a kind of, it really just amps up the visuals and the action to sort of deliver something that's kind of more of a, more of a sort of comf comfort food for the blockbuster crowd, you know, and and it, and it worked at the time. But I think it's over the years it it lost its appeal quite quickly. That style, and um, I think people are, are far more affectionate towards Batman and Batman Returns than the Joel Schumacher films, which kind of been seen as sort of just kind of campy and over the top and and the wrong direction for Batman. But despite Batman. He can be interpreted in many different ways, like like as we've seen with the '60s show and the and the Tim Burton films and Nolan films and the Joel Schumacher ones, where something where something like Superman is not that easily translatable. Once you sort of begin to shift in terms of tone and how we, how the character acts, you 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 begin to move away from what what Superman represents and who he is. Where Batman, you can there is that sort of freedom and um, 
and, and that's what we have you know complete difference of contrast between Batman Returns and Forever um, two different directors from different backgrounds but giving you the same sort of character but interpreted in a different way and it just depends on what sort of frame of mind and what and what appeals to you um, so yeah I think I think Forever itself it's I think it's probably a little bit more true to the comic roots with the showing you the origin stories of Batman with sort of flashback moments but I think Batman Returns is a little bit more kind of plays things a little bit more a little bit more straight and I think that kind of works in its favour it's weird isn't it because when you look at Falling Down and uh, the other oh, one yeah. uh, uh, Lost Boys you imagine if you stuck those two into the Brundle machine from The Fly they'd come out as the perfect <laughs> Batman film um, yeah, but yeah, that's, yeah, a, would, that's a would, gross would, simplification yeah. again we're playing with ideas of like auteur and uh, very simplified here and uh, but uh, I think Burton and, and Schumacher are both great filmmakers in, 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 in oh, different yeah. ways with both brilliant works I, I, I enjoy the discussion about uh, Tim Burton as well just as, as an artist and um, I, I guess mm. We're all we're all kind of looking for through lines in these things. Although these things are, are all highly collaborative too. The ending of uh, Edward Scissorhands ends with um, it's got a similar kind of thing uh, uh, with the uh, the love interest dressed almost like a bride being taken up atop, atop of a gothic tower. Um, yeah. And yet, you know, that was the part of Batman that we're all told is the thing that John Peters and Jack Nicholson came up with. So we feed off each other, and we, you know, it's it's, it's a lot more complex. Uh, in real life it's not as simplified but um, anyway fascinating discussion well everyone that is the end of the commentary I hope you enjoyed it I hope you all have a great Christmas and New Year and me and Tim will be back soon with some more commentaries in future take care everyone and goodbye bye <laughs>